Turn it on and rip the knob off. guys and welcome back to the wrestling memory grenade we're now at episode 75 and as always i am your host ray russell and this is a very special edition of the grenade here this week as we come out of wrestlemania 3 the definitive edition here on the grenade it was a long and winding road to get to wrestlemania 3 and i had such a blast covering all the results the reviews the news everything going in to the big pay-per-view that was wrestlemania 3 an epic event there in the Silver Dome that we discussed at length for the last couple weeks here on The Grenade as part of that 1987 project. And this week, we're going to step away from that project just for one week, guys. Don't get your panties in a bunch. The 1987 and the World Wrestling Federation project will resume next week with April 87 in the WWF as we'll be talking the fallout from WrestleMania 3. Of course, we're going to be looking into all of the April news and results. Lots of comings and goings here in the WWF, especially coming in. Tons of new talent we're going to talk at length about next week on the show. The ramifications that event had on other promoters, and we'll even take a listen to some of the final few episodes recorded of Missy's Manor. But that's all next week on The Grenade. All of the research done in the first quarter of 1987, everything leading into WrestleMania 3, it became very tedious, guys. A whole lot of fun as well. But it's nice to take a week away from 1987 and go back another decade. Say, 1977, in what was then the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. You heard me right, guys. We're going back to the 70s this week on The Grenade as I share with you our brand new podcast. It's part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Of course, you can listen to the Wrestling Memory Grenade, our sister show Monday Warfare, where we talk Raw versus Nitro. And now our newest podcast, it's the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. That's right, it's all Territory Talk on the Regional Wrestling Podcast. And it was just a couple months ago, I went on social media and I asked you guys, the listeners, well, I gave you four options to choose from. What would you like to hear us talk about first? And surprisingly, almost all four of them tied, though one did come away with just slightly more votes, that being 1977 in the WWWF. But because all four topics were so close together, I've already begun research on every single one of those topics, and we'll be covering all of them. In due time here, on the brand new Regional Wrestling Podcast, as part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network on WrestleCopia.com, that's WrestleCopia.com, and everywhere your podcast streaming needs are met, from Apple to Spotify, Google Pod, Pocket Cast, Audible on Amazon, and beyond. And make sure you stop on over to our YouTube channel. You can find us at YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade, where not only do I try and post timely videos that complement our projects here on The Grenade, but also any other random goodies that I might find from time to time as I continue to preserve my VHS collection by converting it all to digital. Subscribe now so you never miss a new video, dropping them all the time. Again, that's youtube.com slash wrestling grenade. And I just mentioned that poll that we did on social media. You guys can follow us on social media. In fact, you can follow us on Twitter at wrestling grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N grenade. Also follow and like us on facebook.com slash wrestling grenade be sure to follow us on twitter and follow and or like us on facebook so that you guys can stay up to date with everything going on inside the wrestlecopia podcast network also let's not forget now is a great time to be a patron a wrestlecopia patron that is and you can check us out there at patreon.com slash wrestlecopia that's patreon.com slash wrestle c-o-p-i-a multiple tiers to choose from but that five dollar all access tier is where it's at Get you so many gifts for just $5, including all of my insanely detailed show notes from both here on The Grenade, as well as our sister show, Monday Warfare, and very soon, our show notes for the Regional Wrestling Podcast as well. Plus, you'll receive early access to many of our WrestleCopia podcasts, listen days, sometimes even a week early before the rest of the listeners. But it doesn't end there. It's our Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series. 
as we cover many old WWF and WCW pay-per-views, Coliseum videos, Saturday Night's Main Events, Clash of the Champions, and so much more. Plus, now remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade, featuring the 1989 NWA project. What does remaster mean? It means enhanced sound quality and new content, originally edited out of the initial broadcast of the show, edited right back in. Plus, now another gift added, it's digital downloads. For your viewing and reading pleasure, I've already dropped four new digital downloads here in December. Many more to come. My way of saying thank you guys for being loyal listeners and patrons here to the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. They're my holiday gifts to you. And you get all of that and more for the low, low price of just $5. So remember, the all-access tier, it gets you my insanely detailed show notes for all of our shows here on WrestleCopia, plus early access to many of the shows, the Patreon-exclusive watch-along series, remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade, and now digital downloads. Talk about a deal. And remember, guys, there's no subscription. You can cancel any time. Give it a go for a month. I think you'll like the content we offer. And every penny of it goes right back in to the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. So please help us pay some of the bills to keep the Wrestling Memory Grenade Monday Warfare, the brand new regional wrestling podcast where we talk the territories, all of that and more help us keep them up and running for the months and the years to come. And with all of that out of the way, I promised it here this week. It's a very special episode of The Grenade. As we debut our regional wrestling podcast, I'm very proud of this show where we promise to bring you 100% territory talk. And if you guys think the research I've done here on the grenade for the NWA 89, the WWF 93, and right now the WWF 87 project, if you thought my research for those were something, as much as I loved growing up throughout the 1980s, that Hulkamania era and everything that came along with it, both in Crockett and the WWF, As much fun as it is to talk about that national expansion era, anyone who really knows me knows that my bread and butter, my real true passion is the territory era of professional wrestling. So many territories, so much talent, so many great angles and promos. It's been an obsession of mine since the late 1980s to study the territory era of professional wrestling. And it's taken a while to get it off the ground, but I'm so excited now to announce that it's finally here the regional wrestling podcast. And we're going to kick things off with the worldwide wrestling federation. That's the WWWF all the way back in 1977, a little different format than here on the grenade. As I try and stop and hit on all of the major angles, all of the big time stars, the title changes, everything in between. And I do have a few guests lined up to join the show, depending on the territories and the topics at hand week to week, but I am happy And I am proud to announce that our very first guest in the inaugural edition of the Regional Wrestling Podcast is none other than the wrestling tape extraordinaire, a man who has watched and studied wrestling even longer than I have. And when he heard this was our first stop on the podcast, he said, hey, I wouldn't mind being a part of that, you see, because this man not only lived this era, but he loved this era. This was the stuff that got him into professional wrestling. I'm delighted to announce Our special guest co-host for episode one of Regional Wrestling is none other than John McAdam of the Stick to Wrestling podcast as part of the Arcadian Vanguard podcast network. So stay tuned. We're going to have a blast as I, Ray Russell, sit down with John McAdam as we talk things like Bruno Sammartino dropping the belt to superstar Billy Graham. Those evil executioners and their feud against tag team champions Chief J Strongbow and Billy White Wolf. We'll also talk White Wolf's injury angle, where he was permanently put out of the WWF by Ken Patera. Now, White Wolf would return 13 years later under a completely different alias. We'll talk about that also on this episode of the podcast. We'll also look at Bruiser Brody on his way out of the company as a new star by the name of Bob Backlund is making his way in. Yes, all of that and so much more. Looking forward to the upcoming conversation we're about to have with John McAdams. So stay tuned, guys, for episode one. It's the inaugural edition of the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. Yeah. 
Hello again, everybody. Lance Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Sola, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon, along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, another outstanding card. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the inaugural edition of the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. And I'm your host, Ray Russell, and that's right, it's 100% territory talk here on the program each and every week, featuring a variety of topics. From event results, we've got special interviews lined up. We'll talk yearly breakdowns of various promotions and eras, deep dives into obscure outlaw promotions, and so much more planned here on the show. And as we launch this program, more often than not, I hope to have special guest co-hosts alongside me to help navigate this fun ride through wrestling history. And now, here it is, guys. It's time to go back in time to much simpler days. We're talking pre-national expansion. The territories were booming. Well, most of them anyway. And a couple months ago, I ran a poll on social media with four options, asking you guys what you wanted the very first topic to be here on the show. And to my surprise, it was nearly a four-way tie, which is pretty awesome, actually, when you think about it. But the winner, by two votes, was 1977 in the WWWF. Yes, we travel back 45 years. Wow. Bruno San Martino dropping the belt to superstar Graham, those pesky executioners looking to regain what they never really lost versus the tag team champions, Chief J Strongbow and Billy White Wolf. And as names like Bruiser Brody are winding down their runs here in the company, we'll see a newcomer by the name of Bob Backlund burst onto the scene. Plus, Kim Patera runs rough shot over the competition and so much more here in 1977 in the World Wide Wrestling Federation. And when I made that announcement online, it received a lot of positive feedback, including from our special guest co-host this week, who I'm about to bring on. To paraphrase the good captain, I feel so good, I feel so fine, so proud and so elated to announce as our special guest co-host for this initial episode of Regional Wrestling. He's often imitated, never duplicated, a man who didn't just live this era, but he loved this era. This right here is the type of stuff that got him in to professional wrestling. So please join me in welcoming Mr. John McAdam to the show. John, welcome to this maiden voyage of the Regional Wrestling Podcast. Happy to have you. I'm happy to be here. I, I didn't realize this was going to be a new podcast. I thought this was going to be the Wrestling Memory Grenade, but that's cool. I love the name of that podcast. So even though this isn't the wrestling memory grenade, we're going to unpin this thing, we're going to throw it at you, and there's, and there's going to be an explosion of wrestling memories. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better. And this act, actually, this particular episode is going to also act as an episode of the wrestling memory grenade. So you're actually on both shows, John, a double guest at the same time. Have you ever done I'm that like before? Two people. Yes. That's, it's, it's all an optical illusion, if you ask the captain. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'm I'm very happy to do this particular show because 1977 WWF or WWWF is a big deal to me. I became a fan of the sport. Uh, I became a hardcore fan like summer or spring summer of 1976. So this is my first full year as a real wrestling fan, and I'm I'm happy to be here talking about it. Yeah, and that's like that was the time, right? Like. That first full year that we have as fans, man, it's it just never got any better. I mean, maybe it did get better, but we still have those memories. They they just they they live within us forever, really. Sure, and you know, it was such a different time. I mean, I have this thing, this uh what is it? The Roku player that's half the size of a hockey puck and it has <laughs> thousands and thousands of hours of pro wrestling on it, not just from Peacock, but from YouTube and whatever else. Back in the day, I mean, you got one hour of wrestling per week, <laughs> minus commercials, 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. If you missed it, you missed it. No VCRs. That's right. And it was almost like, you know, having it was almost like less is was more because you just looked forward to that hour so much. 
obviously I, I got more lucky. I was far more lucky. I grew up throughout all of the eighties. So that's when Vince expanded and had like 40 different TV shows and Crockett had like 40 different, it was, you know, wrestling fans dream. You could flip it on ESPN, watch world class. So there was so much to, to watch back then, but you're right. You know, when, when you only have that one or two hours, if you're watching championship and all star, I mean, but that's all you got, you know, plus commercials, obviously. So that was it. And you were just, you waited all week for that hour. Yeah. And I, I prioritize it. I, I say I got one hour. Then um, at noon, we had the all-star show out of Worcester, Mass. But I was lucky if I could just get the audio. I would sit there wrestling with the oh, rabbit yeah. ears trying oh, to yeah. get this show on on Saturday morning. And like I said, I, I rarely did I get video. Sometimes it was just like listening to the radio. Yeah. And the millennials and the Gen Zers, they'll never get that struggle. But I, too, even had that issue sometimes as a kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, John, you know, before we get going, I apologize. I should mention John has his own podcast, and I'm sure everybody already knows that. It's the Stick to Wrestling podcast, located over at McAdamPod.com as part of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, John. Yeah, I'm very proud to be part of the Arcadian Vanguard. Uh, the show's been going on for about four and a half years now. If you like me on this show, you probably want to listen to Stick to Wrestling every week. It comes out every Friday morning. Uh, it is a variance of wrestling topics, usually 70s, 80s, and 90s wrestling. And the term Stick to Wrestling, it's kind of sarcastic. If someone doesn't like what I'm saying, I don't know, politically, they'll oh, Stick to Wrestling. So that's what I named the show after. But yeah, we 90, 95% of it is pro wrestling talk. I think you'll like it. Yeah, and John always promises to bring you guys a raw bone show and a wicked good time. There you go. Absolutely. And you guys can listen, or you guys, I'm sorry, you guys can follow John on social media on Twitter at CC Milani. That's C C M I L A N I. Or you can just look up Stick to Wrestling on there. John, yeah, you're fairly you, active on Twitter. I, I am. If you search the name John McAdam, just follow the guy with the uh, Stick to Wrestling logo as his avatar. I'd say 80% of it is wrestling, and then like you get another 20% of college football and Boston Red Sox, whatever else. I was going to say, don't forget baseball. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, John, I guess, are you ready to talk the good old days? I am. I was born ready to talk the good old <laughs> days. I'm looking forward to this. 1977, man. The biggest story coming into the year was something that was going on behind the scenes. June no, April 1976, uh, mm -hmm. Stan Hansen bounces Bruno Sammartino on his head. Right. Uh, this thing had to be seen to be believed. They they hid it until Bruno passed away. Uh, Bruno suffered a fractured vertebrae, and as a result, Bruno was like, I want out of this business. I no longer right. I don't need him want out of the business, but he no longer wanted to take on the schedule of the WWF heavyweight champion, and that's the biggest story. Bruno is on his way out. Yeah, and we'll touch on that in just a minute. Guys, I didn't want to just hit the ground running into 1977 for those unfamiliar with the era. I do something on my grenade show, John. I like to call setting the stage. I just did air quotes. Nobody saw them. Uh, where we briefly summarize the goings on heading into the new year. So I, I saw wanted, them. <laughs> so I wanted to set the stage here by going back and briefly looking at 1976, if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah. All right, excellent. So where do we start? But where else with wrestling's only living legend, as he was referred to in the WWF? That's Bruno San Martino, who was, as you just pointed out, the WWF champion. Well, you know, I'm going to go back and forth this entire episode with three W's and two W's. So just so Same everybody here. knows. <laughs> it's just faster doing it the other way. It's so but, much better without the extra W. It, <laughs> it, it is. It is. In, in, in fact, if you want, we can make a pact right now. And, we, you know, we won't hold each other to anything. We'll just... We'll call it whatever we want throughout this episode. I'll call it WWF, and the first W is worldwide, all one word. Okay, sounds great. That makes perfect sense to me. So Bruno San Martino was actually, this was his second time with the title here in the 70s. Now, he won that belt back in December of 73, defeating Stan Stasiak for the belt. Stasiak had the belt a whopping, what, nine days with his win over Pedro Morales there. So now that we're coming into 77, that would make Bruno a champion for three years. Three times, that's a long time to be a champion. Yes. Can you imagine Andre and Bruno in 77? Yeah, really. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, you know what? I mean, that's been talked about. Like, you know, should they have done Bruno versus Andre? I say no, because, A, you're, you're kind of messing with the luster of both guys. Right. You have Andre undefeated. You've got Bruno the champion. 
why ruin it? Why not? You know, they they had the storyline. Andre travels the world. He doesn't want to be held down with the burdens of a, of a singles championship. Right. And, and it, at the end of the day, somebody has to lose there. You, If you're going to pack a house between Andre and Bruno, you're going to have to give somebody a winner. And I, and I just I feel like you can't do that to either one of those guys at this period in this period. No, they had Bruno and Pedro. They went to a draw. I think anyone who had watched wrestling for more than two or three years knew that that was going to a draw. The match was supposed to be supposed to be terrible, and I think Bruno and Andre would have been even worse. I think they they did the right thing by keeping those guys away from each other. Yeah, I agree. So Bruno, at this point, been champion what three years? As you just pointed out, he suffered a broken neck at the hands of Stan Hansen earlier in '76. And he's looking to lessen his schedule and lighten his load and, and go back into what, what you would, what would you call it, semi-retirement here, where Bruno kind of picks and chooses when and where he wants to wrestle. It's funny. About a year ago, I went back and really looked at Bruno's post, uh, his career after losing the title to superstar Billy Graham. He did not wrestle very much at all. I was I was really surprised. I figured, OK. You know, he took it easy, maybe just did weekends and, you know, Madison Square Garden on Monday nights. He didn't even do that. He wasn't even that active for the Larry Zbysko feud. He wasn't even that active for the rematches against superstar Billy Graham. He, you know, he cut his schedule way back. Yeah, it, you know, it's uh, we'll find we'll see that as we go through this year. Bruno still working the big houses, Boston, MSG and whatnot after his title loss. But by, by the fall, Bruno's pretty much out of it, other than he comes back in December and works a date. But Bruno doesn't even really work the final third of this year, for the most part. No, he, did, he didn't. And like I said, when I went back and, and looked at that, I, I was very surprised. So, uh, you know, we get things going here. It's, it's kind of important to mention that Bruno and, and Superstar Graham going into 77 actually already have a history here in the company. Because you can go back to the beginning of 76, January and February in Madison Square Garden. It was Bruno defending his title against Superstar Graham. And of course, in January, they had Graham go over Bruno on a countout. Two men collide. Bruno falls through the ropes, takes a bump to the floor, and eats the countout. Graham goes over. They do the rematch in February, this time Bruno going over due to the uh, too much blood, and uh, both men scoring a, w- a non-decisive win over one another there at the beginning of 76. Now, when do you think they came up with the idea to put the belt on Graham? Because Graham doesn't even come back, obviously, until 77. Do you think they knew... Sometime in 76, or this is a last minute thing, because I know Backlund was planned, as Graham has pointed out, before he even got there. Yeah, Backlund came in. I, I, I specifically remember watching the wrestling on Channel 56 in Boston uh, on Saturday. And on Christmas Day, 1976, Bob Backlund made his debut, at least on on Boston TV. I know Boston was a little bit behind New York. Um, but yeah, they had put Backlund in a position where, you know, it wasn't guaranteed in 1976 that he was eventually going to get the title, but they, you know, they were going, they were grooming him for the spot. They were seeing if, you know, when the time came, he would be ready. Um, as far as, you know, Bruno, my understanding is as soon as, you know, he got hit, he started recovering from his broken neck before he even wrestled his first match back from that. He communicated to Vince McMahon senior that, you know, okay, it's time to start, you know, it's time to figure out an, an off ramp for me to get out of this. And in my opinion, superstar Billy Graham wasn't just the right choice. He was the only choice. He got oh, yeah. over so big in 1976. He was the guy. Everyone bought him as world's heavyweight champion. I, I don't even know who number two would be. Yeah. And I, I came to that conclusion throughout the entire year. If not Graham, who? And honestly, I came to the conclusion when they dropped the belt to Backlund in 78. If not Backlund, then who? And I'm not, and I, I'm not, and I liked Backlund's early work here in the 70s, uh, but not so much in the 80s. And he was never a great promo either. But at the same time, my only thought there was maybe, maybe turn Graham babyface after his run as a heel champion, maybe turn him babyface. And he even works Patera a couple times here in 77 on a couple of smaller venue shows. So I'm wondering, was that to test the waters, do you think? Or, or do they just need bodies in there for the main event of those shows? I mean, those shows, uh, Graham versus Patera for the title took place in Portland and I believe once in Bangor, Maine. And according to Bob Backlund, I believe him, they used Maine as their – they just did weird stuff up there for no reason. It wasn't (laughs) even a testing ground. They just, you know, went off the rails there. You know, I mean, we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're talking 1978. I am 14 years old. 
and Graham has has lost the rematches to Backlund, and he appears to be on his way out. And I say to myself, why don't they turn? Why don't they make him a good guy? He would be the you know an excellent number two baby face. And you know, like I said, I saw this as a little kid, and there it turns out there were reasons why Vince Senior didn't want to do it. So a question for you, John, here, and I, I mentioned this to you in the past when we've talked online. What was your take on the whole blood loss finish? Too much blood, the referee would call for the bell. I'm not trying to discredit that type of finish. I mean, you can get that in boxing. The, 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 the boxer can't see. you got to call the, the match. But didn't they overdo it just a little bit here up in New York? In my opinion, no. I, I That finish has been widely criticized, and, and not everyone's going to agree with me here, but I think it's an excellent finish to keep a program going when you have a top flight heel coming in, you know, like a Greg Valentine, like a Magnificent Morocco, where you want to have a three-match series against the champion. You have a finish where the babyface champion is bleeding. The ref wants to stop it. He's looking at the babyface. The babyface catches fire and starts pounding on the heel, and he's going to win. And no, the referee stops the match or the commission stops the match because the baby face is bleeding too badly. The heel wins the match, but not the title. That's just the way it is in wrestling. You know, he doesn't change hands on count out, uh, disqualification, blood stop. So the heel says, hey, I won. I was about to take the title. I had this guy bleeding like a pig. The baby face can say, hey, I, would, I wasn't ready to stop. The referee stopped me. And you have all the reason in the world to have a rematch. Oh, I lo- and the way you just played that out for me, I love that, and I get that, and I follow that. But I just feel like if I'm if I'm going to the garden, but you know, let's say I'm I'm one of the guys that are there every every show, and I see the same finish three times in the same year, it just feels overdone to where it's it's almost like the dusty finish to me, where I like it, but I don't like it when <laughs> when that's the finish every three four months. And I think that and was- do they really do it every three four months though? I I I mean I could be wrong here. I I, I remember well, it being maybe once every twelve or eighteen months. I, I guess it depends on the arena. I could be wrong here. Well, you know, and I was going through all of the results. So obviously they did it in New York, they did it in Boston, they did it in Philly at some time or another. So maybe I just saw it more often than it was happening at this point. So it just came redundant to me. And I've seen so much, you know, just footage on TV on on the computer and everything. So it's just. I've seen it a lot, I guess, and I'm just lumping it all together into one one thing here. But I do I do like the actual story it's telling. Like the first time I ever saw it, it was it was awesome. I thought it was great. I just then I saw it again and again, you know, and I was like, eh, yeah, got a little less whatever for me each time. But I just it just felt like this time it was commonplace, like a DQ or a counter, at least in the bigger arenas and stuff. It, that's the way it came off to me. So if I'm wrong, I apologize. I I didn't like look and see how many times it happened specifically in the garden or or whatever for a specific year. But what was interesting here, going back to 76 real quick, Graham and Bruno, they worked two shows, not three. I, I thought that was interesting. And then the, the third match, which would have would have been the third match, you would, you would presume, was actually Bruno and his Paisan Parisi. How's that for a gimmick? Tony Parisi. Paisan Parisi. And Bruno Sammartino going over Koloff and Graham in a two out of three fall match. And I think that was the last time in the Bruno or Backland era that they had a tag team match as the main event at Madison Square Garden. Ooh, I never thought of that. And it did seem odd. I'm like, wow, Bruno in a tag match. So that kind of Tony th- Parisi in the main event. E. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Bruno had a heck of a year beyond that, though. So he worked Graham at the beginning of the year. But then, as you pointed out, he begins working with Stan Hansen, I think, around April or so. And it goes through the summer. Bruno suffers the broken neck on that body slam or the lariat if you're cave haven. And um, they have that series at Shea Stadium. They come back and do the cage match. So uh, uh, very dynamic summer for Bruno San Martino and very rough summer as well. Came back pretty fast from that broken neck. He did. And when they brought him back, at least in Boston, they brought him back in the tag team match. It was Stan Hansen and Ivan Koloff against Bruno San Martino and Ivan Putski. I haven't seen the match, but supposedly, you know, Bruno mostly stayed in the corner. He just, you know, he was there to be there, but he wasn't really recovered yet. Yeah, you know, and over on the Grenade show, I've been doing 1987, and it's been rough watching them bring the Dynamite Kid back really early. Uh, You know, he's standing in the corner. He's not really doing a whole lot. People may not notice, but at WrestleMania three, I mean, the hearts were very, very light, very easy on him in the ring. Uh, they were very smart the way they booked him, but very stupid to even bring him back. There was a point where the Bulldogs accompanied Tito to the ring, 
and he was uh, using the, the apron, visibly using the apron to hold himself up. And during the match, he was actually down on his knees watching the match. So it's crazy to think, you know, Bruno, not, not, I'm not comparing that to the dynamite injury, but again, like you said, he stayed over in that corner. So was, you know, obviously coming back a little early. Yeah, he came back way early. Uh, Bruno told the story that Vince Sr., you know, begged him to come back. He said, if you don't come back early, I'm going out of business. Bruno, please. And, you know, that, that's Bruno's side of the story. But right. I, I don't think Vince Sr. was going out of business, but he needed Bruno, at least at that time. Oh, I, I to- totally agree with that. So Bruno comes back, continues working the guy that broke his neck. <laughs> no problem there. Stan Hansen's told those stories several times. He didn't feel great about it. He He caught a lot of heat. Not not necessarily in the wrestling office, but with the fans trying to just get to the garden. Oh yeah, I mean you know, Bruno was a deity in New York and, and and in Boston. I mean, he you know the term "living legend" gets thrown around a little right. bit loosely. Bruno mm-hmm. defines it. I mean, you know, people they they loved him, they worshipped him. And uh, looking at just some of the other names real quick, we're going to try to zoom through 76 here, but I just got to touch on everything here. So he works Hanson all summer, beats him in the cage match. And then who does he go into a feud with, the, or I call it a feud, but who does he begin to work with immediately after Hanson there in the New York City market? Bruiser Brody. So you go from Hanson to Brody. Uh, <laughs> what, what a way to go. Brody gets a two shot deal with Bruno in the garden. So they work September and October, culminating with a Texas death match which Bruno wins there. Bruno then with a one-off with Nikolai Volkov in late October, and then two matches with Stan Stasiak, the former champion, to close the, the year. Bruno beating Stasiak in December in a Sicilian stretcher match. Any thoughts on the, the Brody run or the match with Nikolai or Stasiak? Uh, yeah, Nikolai Volkov seemed to me like a very weak uh, contender in 1976. He just didn't me- measure up to the other guys. I, he and Bruno were friends outside the ring. I'm sure that had something to do with it. You know, nothing against Volkov. A one and done uh, at Madison Square Garden isn't exactly the end of the world. Uh, Brody was great. Brody was doing kind of a caveman gimmick with the Grand Wizard as his manager. This was very uh, early in Brody's career, obviously. Uh, and then Stan Stasiak, they brought him back and they made it sound like this guy hung the moon. He's the former World <laughs> Wrestling Federation champion. You know, they, they didn't mention that, yeah, he was champion for nine days. Right. Um, but, you know, they left us to figure that out, but it, it sounded very mythical. Wow, if this guy did it once, he could certainly do it again. So Stasiak was taken very seriously. And, yeah, and then Ken Patera came into it. And Patera, in Bob Backlund's book, Ken Patera was talking about how he was originally supposed to get the WWF uh, championship, which I find hard to believe. The, the fans didn't know who Patera was. They knew who superstar Billy Graham was from his previous run. Right, which is an excellent segue into where we're going next. We're going to talk about superstar Billy Graham and his previous run. So he came in actually full-time, and I say full-time because maybe people don't know. Back in the day, they would actually bring a guy in long before he was coming in full time, right? John, they would put him on TV. He would come up and do the TV tapings and then go back to whatever territory he was working outside of the WWF. So he might come in for a month, two months, three months working TV tapings only. He's not really in the company yet. No, they're, they're just introducing him on television. You're right. He would come in for two sets of tapings. So six weeks worth. And then when he finally started for the most part, it was in the main event in Madison square garden against the champion. So Graham came in actually full time, I say, in October of 75. So he shows up for TV and he says in his uh, the timeline he did with Sean Oliver, he talks about coming into the first TV taping and he's gifted this manager, the Grand Wizard. And it kind of threw Graham off because he said outside of a little run with Humperdinck in Florida, he never really had a manager because he never really needed a manager. Graham was an excellent talker, obviously. He was. And Jesse Ventura said the same thing. You know, I don't need a manager. Look. Here in the Northeast, every major heel had a manager. Those were the rules. The one exception was Larry Zbysko in 1980, and that's because he didn't have a manager when he turned. But that's just the way it was in the WWF. It was part of the package. And, I, I, you know, both Graham and Ventura, I don't understand how they came up with the idea that they wouldn't have a manager. Of course you're going to have a manager. Everyone did. I'm sure once Graham got to know Wiz and, and everything, I, if I if I was coming in during that period and I got to pick a manager, I'm sure a lot of people would say Albano, 
I would I just love the way the grand I looked I loved his look as a kid. So like I was so I didn't even care what he what he said. It was like this guy just looks cool. <laughs> You know, my, my friends and I, we would play a game when we were kids. Like, we look in the magazine and we'd say, okay, what if Dick Slater came to the WWF? Who would be his manager? It was part of the fun. Right. And the way it broke down, Albano got the tag teams and the geeks. Fred Blassie got the foreign guys and some of the geeks. And if you were good, you were managed by the Grand Wizard. Oh, yeah, for sure. So while, while Graham... Got the whiz. He, he gets going there at the end of 75. And while they're in that run into 76, he, he worked those aforementioned matches with Bruno at the Garden in January, February 76. And then lack of a better term here, I'll let you, you know, fix this for me. But after those two matches with Bruno, everything Graham did, it seemed like after that was a lot of tag teaming with Ivan Koloff specifically. And what I called here, I just called it novelty matches because it was against all the, the big guys like Gorilla Monsoon, Bobo Brazil. Haystacks Calhoun, there really wasn't no end game to it. It was just throw them in there with those the, the big guys and, and the gimmicks like Haystacks and things. Back then, and this was coming this era was coming to an end, everyone had sort of a regular tag team partner. And like I said, this was coming to an end, but superstar Billy Graham's regular tag team partner was Ivan Koloff. Stan Hansen's regular tag team partner was Bruiser Brody. Nikolai Volkov's regular tag team to- partner was Tor Kamada. And like mm-hmm. I said, that was coming to an end, but it was, it was pretty common back then. So Graham winds up leaving the company in May of 76, and he'll return here by March of 77 and do about eight to nine weeks of TV squashes to build himself back up for his title shot with Bruno in Baltimore coming up here in April. And that's where we are with Bruno and Billy Graham. So now we get to the fun part here, I hopefully for you, John. And that's the tag team division, and I'll use air quotes again when I say division. People who were fans in the 80s, they got to watch these big Survivor Series matches with 10 teams, 20 guys. Look at all these tag teams all around. And now people complain because there's not a lot of tag teams in some of the uh, promotions out there. But back then, man, it was like your top heel team and your top face team in New York. Maybe there was a third team floating around somewhere on and off, like like a Zabisco and Gurria or something like that. But here we are in the tag team division, as I as I marked it here, and the current champions coming into seventy seven were Billy White Wolf and your boy, <laughs> Chief J Strongbow. My boy, Chief J Strongbow. I mean, I, I've told this story so many times. I was like a minor wrestling fan. You know, if it was on, I watched it. Like coming into nineteen seventy six, people were like, oh, who's your favorite wrestler? And I'm like, well, Billy White Wolf. You mean Chief J. Strongbow, right? No, I mean Billy Whitelaw. I've never seen Chief J. Strongbow. And when Strongbow came in, he he made me a hardcore wrestling fan. And I know now, I, I knew 40 years ago how terrible Chief J. Strongbow was, <laughs> but he had charisma. I don't know how else to put it, but I mean, people in the Northeast were in love with him. He died like 10 years ago, and I, I heard about it on the internet. But I'm driving home listening to the radio, and they're talking about Chief J. Strongbow passing away. I mean, th- think about that. That's crazy. Yeah, it, it really is in, in today's day and age, especially where everybody tries to forget. You know, like when I was a kid growing up throughout the 80s and, and, and uh, whatnot, I knew all of the famous actors and comedians and things of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. And all, everything was still on TV from 30 and 40 years prior. Now it's like if it didn't happen in the last 10 years, it's irrelevant. So, yeah, it's kind of crazy that, you know, that they do that. But that's how big he was, at least in certain markets. He was. He was really big in the Northeast. He was he was big in New York, but there was something about Strongbow around Boston. I mean, people just ate him up. I mean, we'll talk about this as the show goes on. He didn't Strongbow didn't get title shots against superstar Billy Graham at Madison Square Garden. He got, I think, three, two or three in Boston, uh, one of which was the, the blow off cage match. Right, and we're coming into 77, and Strombo and White Wolf are now champions, but they've only been champions, as far as TV is concerned, for about a week or so heading into 77. Now, the previous champions were the tag team of the Executioners, managed by Lou Albano, the Executioners being Killer Kowalski and Big John Studd, who formed that tag team in March of 76. They won the titles by May of 76 over Ivan Putz, or, uh, excuse me, Tony Parisi and Louis Serdan. So a fun fact here, I, I noticed this when I was doing some research, did you know that Strongbow came back and they did the whole deal? Strongbow and White Wolf became a tag team at the same exact taping that the Executioners won the titles. It was almost like kismet, like it was it was fate somehow. It's almost like somebody booked this. 
I, I, I kind of I knew it happened right around the same time. I, I remember it was uh, Billy White Wolf and Jose Gonzalez were wrestling Rocky Tamayo and Crusher Blackwell. And the heels were beating up on on White Wolf. They threw Gonzalez out of the ring, and Strongbow just comes out of the of the uh, dressing room unannounced. You know, and the fans just went wild, and it was you know the 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 tag team was born. Yeah, I mean, and unfortunately, uh, there's no is there footage of that? I don't think there's footage of that of uh, Strongbow's return to the company. Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. And, and you know, and, back then, I mean, VCRs were. I didn't know anyone who had a VCR right. until like 1981. So Strongbow had been gone since August of 1975. He returns in May of 76. Strongbow kind of jumped around here and there. The famous shark cage match up in, <laughs> up in Detroit. Oh, dear. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so Strongbow did some things in between his time there. But he's back, returns in 76 to save his fellow, quote unquote, Indian White Wolf from a beatdown, as you just talked about there. Really cool insight as well, John. I didn't know who was in the match. I didn't mark that down here in my... Uh, to know that Blackwell was in there, that's pretty cool. So I, I didn't even know what was actually like the match that had happened in. So I appreciate you uh, filling us in. Give us a little insight. And that's why you're on this show. I mean, that's, you know what? If, if that match had never taken place, I could I could have cured cancer by now. I could have done something useful <laughs> with my life. But no, I got hooked on pro wrestling. Wow. Unbelievable. Yeah. So no wonder it sticks in your head. It's just like it happened uh, not, not too long ago. I won't say yesterday, but. Not that long ago. It's, uh, you know, my, my original impressions of wrestling are embedded in me forever. So, But in all actuality, the rumors have it that Strongbow really returned because he got word that Billy White Wolf was getting over. And there's really only room for a uh, one Native American, so to speak. I mean, I know they've become a tag team, but one top Native American here. And uh, you think, did you ever hear those rumors? That's the reason Strongbow came back to kind of make sure that White Wolf didn't steal his long-term spot there in the company. Well, a couple of things. Number one, White Wolf was never a strongbow. I, 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 Billy White Wolf was my first favorite wrestler, but he was never Chief J Strongbow. White Wolf himself did an interview talking about how Chief J Strongbow was jealous of him, and he didn't want, you know, Strongbow didn't want White Wolf stealing his thunder. And I'm sure there was something to that. Like, okay, Strongbow's probably saying, okay, this is my territory, my gimmick. There's only room for one guy with the Indian gimmick. And I'm sure there was something to that, but White Wolf was never a, a threat to Strongbow. I, I mean, White Wolf made it clear in this interview. He did not like Chief J Strongbow. Okay. But that's, we've, we've seen, we've heard that so many times with tag teams. That's unbelievable, but it's a, it's a common thing that seems to happen quite often. It, it happens, you know, but rarely does a guy just come right out and talk about it the way <laughs> White Wolf did. I was a little bit surprised. Like you hear about, Guys in tag teams, either maybe not not getting along, but, you know, he's just not my favorite person in the world. Right. I've been traveling with this guy for three years. We've heard each other's jokes too many times. Um, You know, I heard that about Michaels and Janetti. I heard that about Brian Blair and Jim Brunzel. They didn't dislike each other. It's just they weren't best friends. It seemed to go a step beyond that with Strongbow and White Wolf. Like, you know, Strongbow didn't talk to anybody, so who knows how he felt about it. But White Wolf made it clear he didn't like Strongbow. All right, so these two get paired together, and they don't like each other. It's all, yes. or at least why. So uh, initially, what you know, what do you do? You, you have two Native Americans in the same territory. So what do you have to do, John? You have to team them up, right? Of course. And so here we go. May of seventy six, uh, Strongbow returns, and the new team is born. Unfortunately, they wait until October. We fast forward all the way to October twenty third. TV. We see Chief J Strongbow and Billy White Wolf defeat. The tag team champions of the Executioners in two straight falls. Fall number one saw the Challengers score a win, a pinfall win. Fall number two, however, John, the Challengers are disqual or excuse me, the champions are disqualified after a third executioner is caught interrupting the matchup. Albano is kicking one of the executioners under the ring. Wait a minute. And another executioner. What in the world is going on here? Tornado. We'll have now our three. At least, at least we know there are three. How many executioners are there? We saw three executioners. The biggest three. I counted ten times there. One, two, and three. That's just the official word. Ladies and gentlemen, the time of the second fall, two minutes, 28 seconds. Here are your winners, Chief J. What 
as you know, World Tag Team Championship Pro Tour. And after it appears that in that final fall, if there was a disqualification, he's just been informed by referee Dick Worley, a third executioner coming in, and that, of course, certainly ground for this wall of a day. Ladies and gentlemen, the only way a championship may change hands is either by pinning or submitting. Therefore, there is no title change. However, the winners remain Chief J. Strongbow and Billy Whitelaw. Gonna make a lot of people angry. Let's take a look. We have it. Let's take a look at action. Now look, if you would, there's one executioner under the ring. Yes, this is the man entering the ring now was not the one that's under the ring. There's one under there right now. They hammer away on this one. And look, our battle goes down from behind. Underneath the apron. There are two executioners out there with Captain Lou. And they're dragging a third executioner out. Ladies and gentlemen. There's going to be tremendous controversy surrounding this match. But there we see it with our own eyes. Three executioners. And there's no telling how many executioners Lou Albano really has in his stable. I remember this and just being like, you know, my eyes were bul- bulging out of my head. There are now three executioners on the TV. And the executioners were stripped of the tag team titles for this offense. In a way, that makes no sense. I mean, you know, that okay, it's a disqualification. Why are you stripping them of the titles? But then after they commit a crime so heinous that they can no longer be tag team champions, they're allowed into the tournament to be the new champions. <laughs> right, yeah. And and they continue to cheat in the tournament as well. Not 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 a third executioner, but they're still bad guys. Yes, they certainly are. <laughs> so, you know what? I'll, I'll say this about that feud. It went on way too long. I thought by the time the Strongbows won the tag team titles, finally, they were beyond stale. And I get that in wrestling, there's the old cliche that the the money is in the chase, but this chase just went on way too long. I think they really, they should have waited to bring Strongbow in. Yeah. And actually I had that question uh, coming up for you. So we'll talk a little, we'll touch a little bit more on that when we uh, move along here a little bit, but um, so as per the usual, they score two wins, but that second one by disqualification, and therefore the ring announcer, Gary Capetta, has to announce the title does not change hands to a loud sound of boos from the crowd. We fast forward, though, a week later, we get promos from both sides. First, it's Billy White Wolf, and well, it's really Jay Strongbow, explaining his belief that there were three executioners out there. Out comes Dick Worley, the referee for the match next. He also tells Vince McMahon he saw three Executioners out there, he had no option but to call for the disqualification. The most controversial tag team championship match ever held. Two out of three fall event, but many individuals saw what happened in that third fall. At least they think they saw. Not one, not two, but three executioners. And for this reason, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation is studying the films of last week and considering recommendations as to the action that should or should not be taken by the Worldwide Wrestling Federation in reference to the executioners either holding or stripping them from the Tag Team Championship. Well, right now, let's bring on two individuals who were involved in that Tag Team Championship match last week. Let's bring on Jay Strongbow and Indian Billy Whitewell. But last week, what's your version of what happened? Well, uh, Billy and myself have been uh, thinking about this for a long time because every time uh, it seemed like we wrestled uh, the executioners, you know, in uh, different states uh, have different rules. And uh, some states have rules that between falls you can go back to the dressing room. And uh, I know a couple of times uh, Billy used uh, the death lock on one of them and uh, he hobbled to the dressing room and the next fall started it seemed like the man was stronger so i think this has been happening for a long time i think that uh, there might be three or four or five executioners and uh, i feel that uh, billy and myself are the, are the actual champions because i figure that we beat them right inside this ring here i had the sleeper on one of them inside the ring and uh, when the referee was telling me to turn him loose, I looked up and there was another man standing right inside the apron here. So I feel that Billy and myself are the claimants for the WWWF World Tag Team uh, title. What action do you think should be taken by the Worldwide Wrestling Federation officially? Uh, 
You know, Billy and myself will go along with uh, the Federation. Whatever they want to do, we'll go along with But we're, we're darn right disgusted and, and disappointed because we feel that we're actually the champions and we've been robbed of the, the, the ta tag team title. And, and I think we beat them in other rings around the country. And what actually happened, I think they switched on us. And this is not the first time. This is the only time that that, that Albano got caught doing it. I tell you, we're ready for him. And we... We still claim the titles. We believe that we're the world down, champion. Down, down. Billy and myself worked hard. We trained hard to become world tag team champions and get a fellow like Albano to go to any extreme to do what he's been doing. I think they ought to abolish the mask. Get a man without a mask if he can't get in the ring without hiding his damn... Excuse me. Just don't if, get mad. If, he, if he can't come in the ring without hiding his face, he don't belong inside this ring. That's the way I feel. And Albano is using that to ship four or five executions inside that ring. Chief J. Strongbow and Indian Billy White Wolf. And you heard their version, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, we're going to bring on referee Dick Worley here to my left. And of course, this was the individual who disqualified the executioners in the unquestionably of the controversial match. What is your version of what happened, Dick? Well, during the match, I mean, the match was hot and heavy, and you're trying to watch what's going on in the ring, unless they watch Albano and, you know, pulling his annex outside of the ring. Well, I had looked over, the Indian had the sleeper on uh, one of the executioners, and I had seen one of the executioners fall outside of the ring. I saw Albano bending down. I tried to keep an eye on the sleeper hole. The next thing I know, I could see Albano dragging somebody off, and there was another executioner standing on the apron. So I said to Strongboy, I said, release the hole, they're disqualified, and I just disqualified them right there and then. But actually, Chief J. Strongbow had the sleeper on him. I think the match would have been over right there and then. But then, then comes Captain Lou Albano, and we get this. You're a well-respected official. What action do you think should be taken? I think... I hate to interrupt you, Dick. You're a liar, you're a liar, you're a liar, liar. Let me tell you this, McMahon. At this time, I will make a statement. My champions... We'll never remain world champions. There is no way that you can take the belts from these men unless they are pinned in two decisive falls. And I will say at this time that it was a mere optical illusion. There were not three men. There were two men. The camera playing tricks on my executioners. I will make this statement. You cannot take a championship. You cannot take the belts of my champions. I, I, Captain Lou Albano, I, 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 Captain Lou Albano, and the owner of the world championship. It cannot be taken from me. And Mr. No, Albano, there was no optical illusion last week, and you can hear from the fans voicing their that's a sub trick that they themselves are trying to perpetrate upon our people. We move so fast that there are times they might think there's three or four executions, but the camera can't even keep up with the way we move in our train. We are champions. We do not, and we have not resorted to any illegal tactics. We do not ring under our own cognizance. We do not ring with our own authority and our own power. To see this through, we'll take it to the courts and we'll fight. Yeah. Have the belt put back around yes. Are you aware of the fact, Mr. Albano, that right. Jay Strongbow and Billy White Wolf and many other fans and officials are asking the Worldwide Wrestling Liar. Federation to strip you of the... No, team. no, no! You are we denying the fact that there are three executions. Optical illusion! It's a lie! Strongbow's a liar! The referee's a liar, liar, liar! liar. You've heard it? From the executioners, their version, and also from Lou Albano, they're upset. Strongbow, White Wolf, they're upset. Everybody's upset. And next week, we're going to have on Presley we're the an official champions. ruling. We're the champions. We're the champions. We're the champions. We'll be back the with the very first match in just a moment. All right, so All right. there we have it. Captain Lou, uh, an optical illusion, John, or optical yes. or an optical delusion also. Captain Lou has no idea what he's saying sometimes, and that's what made him Lou Albano. I, lo I love him for that. But So an optical illusion, they, they, I can't believe, I love this line, 
the the executioners and and you, you never hear Kowalski blame for this or stud for that matter. They were moving so fast, John, that that's why we thought we saw three of them. <laughs> it was how bad it was such a national treasure back then, man. Unbelievable. So it's like a three week story arc here on TV. We get the, we get the match, we get the promos, and then finally November sixth television an announcement from the WWF president Willie Gilsenberg that the tag team champion executioners have been stripped of their belts due to that third executioner, for those who don't know, that was Nikolai Volkov hiding under the ring there, uh, appeared during the matchup, tried to get involved there. So Strongbow and White Wolf got the win. The executioners got to keep the titles for a couple weeks, TV anyway, and now they're stripped of the titles for cheating. And then they brought out this tournament that was that was just painful. I mean, it went on for weeks and weeks, and you'd have jobber tag teams in the middle of it, uh, like you know Bill Berger and Silvano Souza, and you know like towards the end, and Vince would be like, "Oh, this they're a, a a late entry into this tournament." I'm like, "Yeah, that's how tournaments work." You know, I will just put this this team into the sweet 16 out of nowhere. It made yeah. no sense. They, they, they threw a lot of uh, extra tournament matches in here, but the gist of the tournament, and I wrote these uh, results down. So correct me if I'm wrong here, but these are the results I got strong and white wolf in the first, uh, not the first round, the quarterfinals by this point. Cause the first round, as you pointed out, was just a bunch of random matches that really had no reason to rhyme. But uh, we, we see strong and white wolf over the team of bruiser Brody and Hanson on a DQ. Boy, that would have been interesting back then, huh? Yeah, they, I mean, you know, Brody and Hanson teamed pretty regularly uh, in the w- in WWF, especially in B-towns or, you know, the smaller arenas, the high school gyms, the uh, ice arenas, you know, Jack Witchies in North Attleboro, et cetera. Yeah, and I mean, they broke in together. They They were no strangers to one another or teaming up, but it's just really cool to see them teaming here up in New York. It just seems like, uh-oh, they, they seem out of place up in New York, like, there's some people going to get their butts whipped. <laughs> yeah, and some people did. I, I mean, they were new to the business, and like like you said, they knew each other. I mean, it, it seemed like you know, even though they had different managers, I mean, they they teamed on TV a few times, and you know, they they, they had chemistry together. So we know Chief J and Billy White Wolf advanced to the semis, as do your favorite, no, not your favorite team, but the the cheating team of the Executioners, as you pointed out, were allowed back into the tournament, which makes no sense. I'm stripping you of the belts, but you guys can go back and try to win them back if you want to. Executioner, as best as I can tell here, a quarterfinal match over the future invader, Jose Gonzalez, and special delivery Jones. Also, this is interesting. Jones doing double duty here because they just really didn't care in this quarterfinals. It's Tor Kamada and Nikolai Volkov over the top caliber team, as you also mentioned. This time it was Frankie Williams and SD Jones. And to round things out, quarterfinal matches, Gorilla Monsoon teaming with Jose Gonzalez, who had already been eliminated. It sounds like WCW in 2000. It's Gorilla Monsoon and Gonzalez over the pair of Johnny Rods and Gashouse Doug Gilbert. Gashouse Gilbert, I was told an interesting story by Kevin Sullivan. He said that he got that nickname because he was the first wrestler everyone was 100% convinced was on steroids, which... I think it's weird because Superstar Billy really Graham was gonna say, there that's, earlier. That's exactly that's what I was going to say. Kevin said. And you know, I've seen some of Gilbert here in the WWF, and I'm not saying he wasn't on the steroids. I'm sure he was. But at the same time, I was looking at some pictures of him. I, I've seen him in some of the matches on video as well, but I was looking at some pictures of him at the Garden and things. I'm like, that guy doesn't look like, and, and you can look like you're not on him and still be on him, but I, it wasn't like obvious. You know what I mean? Whereas Superstar Graham, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, come on. Yeah. No, so, I mean, Gilbert looked like he was on them, but I mean, you know, the the, the idea that he somehow stood out, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Yeah. So we move on to the semifinals. It was Strongbow and White Wolf over the Executioners on a DQ, and it was Kamada and Volkov over Gorilla Monsoon and Gonzalez on a countout. Notice the pattern here, non-finishes. Yes. I and, mean, the, the, <laughs> you, the WWF was just full of those. If you had any kind of star level... You were not doing a clean job. So we go forward just one more week here. Chief J Strombo and Billy White Wolf in the finals of the tournament finally score that win that they needed, defeating the team of Volkov and Kamada, not the executioners in the final, by disqualification to win the vacant WWF title. So even in the finals, they couldn't give us a finish. 
the finish they had, and mind you, I was 12 years old, okay? The finish that they did was Torquemada blinded Billy White Wolf with the salt, and the referee saw it and called for the DQ. Strongbow goes to and grabs the belts, and he shows them to White Wolf, and I'm waiting for White Wolf to be so overwhelmed by the fact that he won the title that it would cure his blindness because I was young and I was living in a cartoon <laughs> world, and it didn't. They, you know, Billy White Wolf was still blind, but strong, you know, blinded by the salt temporarily, and Strongbow, he and Strongbow had finally won the belt after so many months of you know trying and just missing. So this particular match, now you said you were you got that Boston feed, so you got everything a little later. So my question here might be irrelevant to you. I wrote here, was this match actually aired in the New York market, WOR, on Christmas Day, or I should say Christmas night. So I wrote, was this a, a Christmas present for you, John, or should I say a, a late present for you here watching it your, was your a hero win the belt present for me even though by this point i honestly i was tired of strongbow and white wolf the <laughs> way it worked and i i had i'm from new york i have relatives in new york and anytime we went to visit the relatives in new york i watched the the midnight show on channel nine and two weeks later i would see that same show again in boston on channel 56 so we were exactly two weeks behind Okay, two weeks behind. That's good to know. I mean, I never knew that. I wonder when they everything caught up. Do you think it caught up when Vince? January nineteen eighty four. Okay. Well, wow. <laughs> Just in time for Hulkamania. Uh, no coincidence there. I believe. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing. So my other question at this point in the show, though, the feud and the title switch. You touched on it already, so you kind of already answered this question. But do you think it was too drawn out? I mean, we still have these two going at it, and the and the baby faces. It, I mean, they've been chasing since basically May. May, June, six months later, they finally get the belts here at the end of the year. Where I, and you you said you were kind of over it by this point. Did did it bring back any of your juice for this, or were you still like, eh? No, uh, by, by the time Strongbow and White Wolf won the titles, I, I really, I no longer cared about that team. And, you know, I mean, time goes by much more slowly when you are younger. But, I mean, that, that feud was beyond drawn out. I You know, I look at the results, and I still see... <clears throat> White Wolf and Strongbow going at it with the Executioners in 1977. And I'm like, right. this is ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, almost up until they're gone. The Executioners leave the company. Yeah. And it was, you know, I've talked about this on Stick to Wrestling. I mean, I had just started watching wrestling when the Executioners showed up. If, if you had watched two years earlier, I mean, there's no way you couldn't have known that that was killer. One of them was Killer Kowalski and the other one was Chuck O'Connor. There, You could not have not known. But was was Stud, was he there like prominently enough on TV to have remembered his physical build? Kowalski, I agree with. If you were watching, you know, in a time period, there's just nobody else with that body type. It's just a, and then he cuts promos under the hood here. We, we heard, uh, you know, uh, back in October when he was explaining when him and Lou Albano were explaining the the third executioner or the optical illusion, if you will, depending on who you want to believe. So we hear his voice. It's very distinguished voice. You know, you know, that's Killer Kowalski's voice. He I mean, they did interviews with the executioners almost every week. And if you had ever heard Kowalski before, you you absolutely had to know it was him. But wait, Kowalski had been wrestling under a mask in 1974. So if that's not enough of a tip to you, right. you know, his voice, his body, he, you know, he's been wearing a mask. That's right. I forgot about that. That's right. So we're about to jump into 77, but before we do, I just want to touch on some of the names we're going to be running into here in 77 and start off with the mainstays, guys that were already here. We talked Bruno, White Wolf and Strongbow, the Executioners. We haven't mentioned them yet, but Polish Power Ivan Putski, Gorilla Monsoon, and by the summer, you know, Nikolai and Kamada arrived in 76. So they've been here in the company for at least six months at this point themselves. Yeah, and Kamada, you know, he got one shot against Bruno, I think, in New Haven in 76. I mean, I you know, I bought Kamada as a star, believe it or not. And looking back, I'm surprised that, you know, they didn't get more out of him. Kamada could be pretty entertaining. Yeah, and, you know, I, was, I would agree with you 100%. I, I've seen Kamada work. I've even seen some of his, you know, later stuff after this in the garden, uh, coming off the top rope. I mean, the, the guy was very mobile for, for his size and for his age. Yeah, he. I mean, let's face it. He was a big fat guy with a big stomach, <laughs> but like he could be a lot of fun, and he could bleed like crazy when the occasion called for it. And we'll be speaking more about that. 
And uh, there's a list, and as people may notice, if they go and they check out the history of wrestling and they, they start looking through the territories, a common time for someone to leave a territory and, and show up in a new territory is right around the new year. And that's no different here this year in the New York market because uh, a lot of guys are starting to leave the company. And they include Victor Rivera, who actually didn't return until the fall of 76, but he's already gone by the end of the year, which is really odd for the WWF to have a guy come in, work three months, and then just leave the company, especially since Rivera had done all that he had done prior to jumping over to the IWA. Yeah, Rivera, um, his push didn't reflect the push that he had gotten earlier. I mean, Mm -hmm. he was one of their top guys, you know, in the late 60s and early 70s. Right. And when he came back in 1976, he was clearly a step behind, not just Bruno, Putzky, uh, et cetera, but he was a step behind guys like Strongbow and White Wolf. He was right around at Dominic DiNucci's level. Wow, yeah, and I haven't seen a lot of Rivera from 76, so I wasn't really sure where his pecking order was. But wasn't it so interesting back then? You could literally take the 20 names and you could put them in the exact pecking order back then. You kind of knew where everybody was. There wasn't just preliminary guys. There was like an order. You knew who could beat who. It, it, was, mm-hmm. it was always a fun time to be able to sit there and do that. You knew where everybody was on the card. Yeah, you didn't just have tiers. It was like, you know, stars, jobber to the stars, jobbers. It was like, you know, I knew that SD Jones got a little bit more of a push than Jose Gonzalez, got, who got a little bit more of a push than, than Johnny Rivera. Yeah, and that's an excellent that's an excellent list there because that's correct. It would go Jones, Gonzalez, Rivera, and and all and all of those guys were phenomenal talents. Really, they really were. Um, Johnny Rivera was small. I shouldn't say small. He was short, but he was very well built. He was wide. He could throw a great a great drop kick. Excuse me, but yeah, I mean his 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 stature held him back. Yeah, it, it, he he was a uh, on the shorter side, but I was I always get excited. Well, I don't want to say excited, but when I'm watching, you know, the old stuff from the '70s, and I see Johnny Rivera in there, I know the match is probably going to be pretty decent for TV. Yeah, it was always you know when you got Johnny Rivera against a, a top heel, you knew what the result was going to be, but at least this time the babyface was going to get in some offense, unlike a Steve King, unlike a Charlie Brown who just you know sit there sat there and got pummeled every week, right. So Rivera's gone by the end of the year. Stan Hansen's pretty much finishing up. Kevin Sullivan's out the door as well, I should point out. Bobo Brazil actually worked quite a bit for the company in 76, and I didn't realize that until I was going back and doing this research here. Bobo was there quite a bit here uh, in 76, but gone by the end of the year. Two things I want to talk about. Kevin Sullivan's career was ended in the beginning of 1977 when his, uh, his, he su- suffered a severe neck injury at the hands of Ken Patera. I don't know who this guy was who was in Georgia and Florida and everywhere else pretending to be Kevin Sullivan, but I assure you Vince McMahon told me on TV that his career was over. Same thing with Jose Gonzalez. Ken Patera gave him a, a neck injury that put him out of wrestling forever. Wow, I thought it was because Carlos Colon came in and worked the garden show and then Gonzalez disappeared back to Puerto Rico with him, but it's good to know. No, nah, and uh, same thing with <laughs> Billy White Wolf. That guy who it yeah. was Sheik Adnan obviously is not <laughs> Billy White Wolf. His career was ended at the hand, hands of Ken Patera. Doppelganger. Uh, Brazil was billed as the United States Stacey. champion. Yeah. And I, I, to this day, I don't know what to make of that. You know, every time they announced him, the United States heavyweight champion, Bobo Brazil, there was no championship belt. There were no feuds built or programs based around this championship. Uh, I don't remember there being any uh, notable uh, title defenses in Madison Square Garden or the Boston Garden, but they built him as, as that every time he came out. Well, we'll talk about another title here in just a little bit that I don't remember being defended here either. Uh, also leaving the company, but at least we get a little taste of it here in 77. Bruiser Brody is going to be gone by the first week of February, but he's still here for another month. We're going to touch on Brody in a little bit. I always wondered why they didn't do a program, a real program with Bruiser Brody and Andre the Giant. I mean, even you know, as a kid, 12, 13 years old, I'm like, okay, this is the most natural matchup out there. And they, they never did it. And this is before, you know, Brody turned into Brody where he, you know, he didn't do jobs. He didn't sell, et cetera. Right. Yeah. So uh, at least we get a little bit of Brody talk here when we begin the 77 here in just a moment. But I also want to look at all the returning names so that everybody knows who has just returned to the company here 
as we begin 77. So they're not wondering, why is he positioned here on the card? Why is it like this? And there's a lot of names. I, I just mentioned a ton of names that left the company in December of 76, but there were a lot of names that came back. They returned to the company in December of 76. Also, some other guys making their debuts. Tony Gurria returns. Sigh. Also, but Larry Zabisco, we hadn't seen him since the early part of 75. Also, John, I don't know how much of a fan you are of Tony Gurria. You might find out as we continue this show. I just felt like I, I didn't understand his push. Tony was a really good looking guy with a good physique. And I, I really, I thought they could have done more with him, to be honest. I thought he, you know, he, the role they gave him when he came back at the very beginning of 1977, they could have done more with him. And superstar Billy Graham's first title defense in Boston was against Tony Gurria. Yeah, Graham worked Gurria quite a bit here as champion. The uh, Vince, the elder, didn't seem to, you know, have an issue with Gurria, at least in the smaller markets and things. Uh, but you, what'd you say, Boston also? Yeah, they had they had a, a a card scheduled, um, you know, before April thirtieth, where Bruno Sammartino was supposed to defend against uh, George the Animal Steel, and further down the card was Superstar Billy Graham against Tony Gurria. And when Graham won the belt, it was like, okay, well, that's a title match now. So Gurria and Zabisco return both December 76 TV tapings, I should point out. We'll see them teaming a lot here in 1977, but also coming to the company in December of 76 TV was Baron Von Roschke. How do you think Baron Mikel Sakluna felt about that? He was already doing jobs every week, but now there's a second Baron in town. Was he was he fearing for his, his career here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Sakluna <laughs> was just playing out the string and he would continue to do so. Uh, into 1983, but yeah, I, I kind of noticed that there were two Barons, and I'm like, wow, are these guys going to be a tag team? No. <laughs> Night and day, the, the pushes that Roshki and uh, <laughs> Sakluna were, were given here. I mean, and, and they kept, I mean, not to get off of 76, 77, but I mean, by the time Sakluna uh, retired in 83, I mean, my God, he was physically falling apart. He was wearing a singlet to try to hide the fact that his body was that of an old man. I mean, you know, he, he played it out as long as he possibly could. Yeah. I mean, obviously a company man, they must have loved him up there because they, like you pointed out, they kept him until the wheels fell off. Yeah. They, I mean, he must've been, you know, he had been there since he was a tag team champion, like 72 and just homesteaded. I know he lived in New Jersey and that's just what he did for a, a living, you know, going on the road, being a wrestler as, as long as he possibly could, like you said, until the wheels fell off. Also returning in the tail end of 76, now into 77, Stan Stasiak. We talked about his couple matches with Bruno. It's it's interesting to know how, how serious he was taken as a challenger because all I saw from Stan in the late 70s, well, not only was he fairly immobile in the ring, but Vince McMahon on commentary would, I wouldn't, he would never bury talent, but he would point out that that heart punch really isn't getting the job done anymore. And guys were re blocking it and reversing it and doing all these things with it. It wasn't Stasiak wasn't the same Stasiak, but it's interesting to know when he first came back that they they made him a serious threat. They did, and I I took him very seriously as a threat. Um, I mean, you know, obviously he was a draw, and he was just one of those guys. Like you know, by the end of '77, he should have been on his way, but you know, by the middle of '78, he's he's on TV doing jobs and tag team matches, and he was still being billed as a former. WWF champion. I mean, my honest opinion was they should not have had him out there, but I guess they liked him. I, I, you know what? A lot of people like Stan, Stan Stasiak. I remember him playing out the string in Portland and them, them talking on TV, talking about, yeah, you know, Stan's getting towards the end of his career. If you need a salesman or a spokesman for your company, give us a call. You know, Stan will help you out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it pays to be a good guy sometimes. Uh, lesson to be learned, exactly. So Stasiak's back. Also, we get a couple of newcomers to the company. They start at the end of 76 doing TV tapings. That is a fellow by the name of Bob Backlund. Maybe you guys have heard of him. Also, another fellow by the name of Ken Patera. Yeah, Patera was really impressive. I read about him in the magazines. Um, I was very surprised to see him show up in the WWF as a heel managed by Captain Lou Albano. Uh, Bob Backlund I had read about. He was a big deal in Florida. He had been the Missouri State uh, heavyweight champion. Surprisingly enough, when, I mean, Backlund, Gurria, and Zabisco all showed up right around the same time, I want to say within a month of each other, and it felt like the three of them were getting kind of an identical push. Uh, you know, the 
little bit less than Ivan Putsky type push. And no, I didn't realize at the time they were gearing up for something with Bob Backlund. Talk about grooming a guy. I mean, Backlund comes in at the end of 76 and he just does TV for nearly a full year. He doesn't even go full time with the company until December of 77. And I didn't realize it at the time. I was very surprised when I learned that, that he would just come up, do tapings, and then fly back to Florida and do whatever he was doing there. Yeah, so we've discussed all of the, the, the rest, although I saved the best for last, though. So long before the Portuguese Mano were Aldo Montoya, there was the Portuguese champion, Carlos uh, Raca or Roca or Horsha. Or it depends Rocha. on how you want. Yeah, Rocha. Okay. Well, I've heard it pronounced various ways, including the Portuguese way, and it's going to be hard for me to keep doing that. So we'll go with Rocha here. <laughs> Who was a, he was 50 years old at the time he was brought in here in January of 77. John, I know you, you said you had, a, you had the reasoning for them bringing Rocha in here at the, uh, the age of 50. They did. Rocha looked very old. And he looked very out of place. And no one has actually told me this, but the, here's here's what I have deducted, okay? I used to live in North Attleboro, Massachusetts in mm-hmm. 1977. I lived there. And they had weekly wrestling at Jack Witchie's Sports Arena, which I learned was about a mile down the road from where I lived. And I attended a couple of uh, shows there. And that was a very heavily Portuguese area like providence new bedford you know north attleboro the attleboros etc what's the name of it you know just around there and i i looked back and counted carlos rocha was in the wwf for about six months right he main evented 11 11 shows at jack witchy sports arena inside that six month period and i'm not kidding it felt like more I just went to the history of WWE and looked that up, and it felt like he was in the main event every week. And again, I, I really believe it was for the Portuguese fans in that area. And he actually got a main event against superstar Billy Graham at the Providence Civic Center right. during that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I did a little research myself on that. So that was the same conclusion I came to, but I wanted to wait and hear your take on it because... You, you came to me, you're like, hey, I, I think I got this figured out. And I was like, okay. And then I did a little research myself and I said, I think we're probably going to come to the same conclusion. But I, I too, I, you know, I looked everything up and it, it does appear that everywhere he, he, I won't just say main event, but he headlined or he got one of the top tier matches was usually a city with a large Portuguese population, either with immigrants or, or Portuguese Americans, places like Providence, Rhode Island, as you pointed out, lots of places in Massachusetts. And then I did a little more search on the Portuguese populations and Massachusetts has six of the 10 highest Portuguese populated cities by percentage in the entire United States. Rhode Island has two. So eight of the top 10 cities in the entire United States uh, by percentage of the Portuguese population are all right there in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it again, it showed, you know, I mean, there was a it was a fishing industry. And for whatever reason, they brought in a lot of Portuguese immigrants around Fall River, New Bedford, Providence, et cetera. And I'm not sure, you know, the, the, the statistics you gave out, if they're if that was like a 2022 statistic. But I can tell you it was even more underlined 50 years ago. OK, they had a, a weekly Portuguese newspaper that I delivered. Wow. Okay. Well, that that's putting it in perspective. I appreciate your insight there. Thank you. So I went online. I was trying to look. There's like no video footage for some reason of Rocha, who had worked for many years, or, you know, around the horn. Usually, we can find like one match of uh, pretty much anybody if you look hard enough. And I just couldn't find a match of him. But I found a lot of younger pictures of him. I said, "This guy looked pretty put together, well in shape, pretty decent looking guy." I get it. And then I saw one picture of him, probably from around this time period. And I said, "Oh my God, he looks." Pretty damn rough for 50. He looked like a hard 60, man. Uh, 60. <laughs> I mean, he. I know they say back in the day, everybody aged you know, worse oh, than yeah. they, they do now. But man, for 50 years old, I mean, he was, you know, I, I remember my grandpa when he turned, uh, you know, in his 50s and he didn't look anything j- this bad. But, but <laughs> Roach, I, he didn't even look like a wrestler, I guess. You know, he just kind of looked like somebody's grandpa. <laughs> no, he, he did. And it, it stood out. It really stood out. It's like, you know, why is this guy? This older guy who's you know really not in shape, you know what is he doing in the wrestling business? Um, you know, and I, I figured out the, the the Portuguese connection, you know, years later. But I mean, he stood out as someone, and I couldn't, you know, every week I would get the newspaper with the 
uh, with the clipping from Jack Witchie Sports Arena telling us the, what the matches were going to be, and I'd see Roach in the main event. I'm like, what is this, you know? And it's funny because, you know, when he was gone, he was gone. I figured, you know, you look back, you're like, okay, well, just keep him around and put him on the undercard if, if the Portuguese population likes him so much. But no, he just disappeared quickly after that. Yeah, so he gets a six-month run of me- mediocrity here in 77. But he does get that title match with Graham, even though Graham says he doesn't even remember who, who Rocha was. Um, do you think Aldo Montoya was like the revisit of this? Like Vince was just sitting around one day and he's like, God damn, pal, uh, we, we need us a new Portuguese superstar. We need another Carlos Rocha. <laughs> I bet he was. I mean, that's from what I understand. That's just how <laughs> Vince operates. Just something would jump into his head like he'd remember Carlos Rocha. Oh, I get this kid from Connecticut. Get him in there, damn it. We need a Portuguese superstar, and we need I need a, a turkey. Light on the mustard. <laughs> so, of course, you know, down the road, we'll be talking other new guys returning to the company, Fuji and Tanaka. Peter Maivia shows up, George Steele, Butcher Vachon, Spiros Arion, Larry Sharp and Jack Evans. Random appearances by guys like Dusty Rhodes, Andre, Haystacks. Dewey Robertson jumps in here at one point. Uh, my guilty pleasure also. We get to talk a little bit about the Golden Terror. The Golden Terror, it was, I mean, he really stood out as being goofy. He was uh, Pete Darty uh, with basically a banana suit. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he had this gold mask, gold trunks, gold uh, top, managed by Captain Lou Albano at least to start with. And, I, you know, I, I was just like, you know, is, is this guy really going to wrestle for the championship? What are we doing here? He came in right around the same time as Butcher Vershawn. And just, you know, middle of the card heels that were managed by Lou Albano. But at first you're, you're like, you know, is this guy going to get pushed? You know, is, is he going to be in main events? And, you know, the answer turned out to be no. All right. And all of that kind of just sets the stage. And for those who are unfamiliar with my grenade show, that's what I do at the beginning of any of my projects. I like to let everybody know what's going on, who's coming in, who's going out, what's the stories heading into the new year, rather than just, like I said, hitting the ground running. People are like, wait, I don't understand what's happening here. I feel that's really an important thing to do. Just give in, in your knowledge, your memories it really, you know, enhance this whole thing. Well, thank you. I'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm, I love talking about this stuff. So let's talk now that we're in 1977. Let's talk about the way the TV was set up back then. Of course, you had the A show, if you will, championship wrestling tape back then out of the Philadelphia arena. Graham's talked about it before. He said that he liked that one better because there was one big locker room where everybody was in the same locker room. They could all congregate and talk and things of that nature. And Gary Capetta at this point was the, I believe was the ring announcer here at championship wrestling. I think Gary Capetta was there full time by this point. Yes. No, Uh, I believe Gary Capetta was doing the all-star wrestling and Joe McHugh was doing the championship wrestling. Again, I I'm pretty sure that's what this setup was in 77. Okay. I thought, I thought they flip flopped. And Capetta went to All Star when when they changed to Allentown, but I'm not positive. That's why I was asking you. Okay, no, I you know what I, I could be wrong. I mean, I remember Gary Capetta just being this really young guy. I mean, he looked like he could have been in high school. <laughs> yes, and then was, you got uh, Joe McHugh, who you know is is, is the opposite. was very old at that point. <laughs> and it's fun to watch some early Joe McHugh because he doesn't realize he's a gimmick yet, so he's just doing regular ring announcing. So he's like, "Hey, my name's Joe McHugh." And then later, he's like, my name is Joe McHugh, <laughs> you know, so he kind of got it, you know. He's, and he got a pop every time he did <laughs> it. Right. I certainly did. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So so, uh, so All-Star Wrestling, which was the other show, and you said you really couldn't pick that one up in your, your area. You had to do the Rabbit Ears gimmick, and, and you had just kind of like listening to it on the radio. And that was taped at the Fieldhouse in Hamburg. Yeah, and it was, you know, it was definitely a, a B show. I mean, it was almost like, okay, you know, the the – championship wrestling you know if if you got that you got everything you needed and then the all-star wrestling was just like okay here's another hour and what they did was they taped their promos all day they all came in that one day they taped all their promos all day long well most of the day and then at night it was time for the matches and they would tape uh, three tv tapings and we get like one big main event dark match and I've I've talked to people who have attended those and they said that the, the dark matches were basically a joke They would always be a non-finish, and they would be over within five minutes every single time. Oh, I don't doubt that. I'm sure everybody just wanted to get out of there. I've been, you know, I've been to some shows in my time. Now there were finishes because they didn't care. They weren't on TV. But, you know, the matches were short. It's like, all right, here's your match we promised. We're we're heading out of here. 
Yeah, that, that's exactly what I am told it felt like. And really, any time you went to the Boston Garden, you had that one last match at the end of the night. Usually it was like a, a feature match, let's say uh, Andre or Patterson against a heel who was on their way out. I mean, that match would go by pretty quick, usually. And back in the, from like 73 onwards or 72, 73 onwards, when they changed the championship and all-star format, Vince McMahon took over as the lead commentator on both shows. And I say lead because he was joined at, you know, for, for several years here in the, in the mid seventies by Antonino Rocca, who was a, a legend in the New York market, going back to the fifties and the, the early sixties with, with Miguel Perez as a team. And even by himself, Antonino Rocca could do no wrong. And I'm sure that's probably why he had the job here, but he didn't really, didn't really mesh well on, on commentary. It's like kind of here to tell back in the old day of the, the pre-talky movies, the silent films, some of the people didn't really move over too well. Their voices didn't really move over too well. And I felt like Rocket was great, you know, in his time in the ring. But when it, I don't know that he was necessarily the right choice here for, for the uh, color analyst in the 70s. His, his accent very thick. I mean, he was very difficult to understand. And you, you just can't have that on commentary. I think if they, they, if they wanted to give Raka a role, which... They should have. I mean, he was that big a deal. And if he right. was, you know, he from what I heard, he needed the money. So, I mean, you know, make make him uh, Jose Gonzalez's manager or Victor Rivera's manager or something like that. Yeah, definitely a superstar in his time in the ring, but just didn't trans well here, translate well here to the commentary booth. But here's the thing. So we go back and we heard those sound bites during those executioner matches with White Wolf and Strongbow and all that nonsense. Antonino Rocca is on commentary still at the end of October of 76, but I don't have anything that I can prove that he was there anywhere beyond that point. It seems like he disappears after that. Can you confirm that? Did he leave somewhere around that time frame, or is it all kind of sketchy? Uh, you know, if I recall correctly, he was doing it until he died. It, okay. Again, if I recall correctly, um, because I remember them doing the announcement that he had passed away, and it it felt like he had just he had just been there so i mean either i i he was doing it not long before he passed away i i'm pretty sure of that okay i just can't seem to find any footage from like the beginning of 77 to confirm he's still there i mean obviously we know he's still there during october of 76 due to that audio at the very least uh, and he'll even work as a special referee on a february 17th show in staten island uh putsky over kamada in the main event there so he did a a match as special referee just a month before his passing. Yeah, and you know what that that really would have been a a good role for him, you know, to do that every, once a year or once every eighteen months at like Madison Square Garden. I think that would have made a lot of sense. But as far as I know, they never did it. So the average TV back then, and we'll take you guys through this really quickly. Uh, an episode, a typical episode of Championship or All Star Wrestling would usually be two matches. Then you would get a ringside promo. And then usually about another three matches, usually about five matches would be on the show. So you get about five matches, lengthy squash matches usually, and then a promo somewhere right in the middle. I mean, a, live, a, a ringside promo with the fans there. I'm not talking about the other uh, localized promos. Right. What they did on championship wrestling in Boston was they would have two matches and then they would have a segment that went yeah, five or six minutes where it was nothing but interviews for the Boston Garden. And then you would have three more matches to finish off the hour in New York, they had six matches. So there was a match that aired in New York every week that did not air in Boston. And they would have the Madison square garden uh, promos distributed throughout the throughout show. There. Right. Right. Okay. So it's, uh, that's cool to know. I didn't know that it was different based on the city. I just assumed the localized promos were inter interspliced here and there throughout the, the episode everywhere. And clearly that's not the case. And, very cool to know. New new news for me here as far as the Boston market goes. Very cool. Yeah, they would uh they would only do interviews during that spot where we wouldn't, you know, New York had that third match, but then during the matches you would have a voiceover of either Vince McMahon or Howard Finkel talking about, you know, hey, don't forget there's a show coming up in Boston or don't forget there's a show coming up in Malden, New Bedford, Concord, wherever. Right. And we get those Finkel voiceovers going into the 90s. They would still do that. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the big shows. Talk about, let's talk about Madison Square Garden and, and things like that. Gar the Garden was the first building to have its events televised on TV as far as HBO and then later the MSG network goes. You guys, Boston didn't come into play until like 85, right? Boston Garden didn't get TV until 85. 
no, uh, May 1985 was when Nesson first started airing the uh, the monthly or usually monthly uh, shows from Boston Garden. I think that was just kind of a uh, Nesson needs programming when the Red Sox and Bruins aren't on sort of thing. But yeah, and that lasted until 88 or no, early 89 that it lasted until. And uh, yeah, they, I believe they ended Boston and Philly the same month. They, they Yes, cut. they did. Yeah. Um, they, uh, and Los Angeles as well. Uh, Los Angeles started airing the, the shows from the, uh, where the, the, wherever the Clippers played in, in 88. And that, that got pulled in early 89 too. And that's because the uh, WWF was blaming their declining uh, attendance on those shows being aired, you know, kind of ignoring the fact that even in the markets where, the shows didn't air. Attendance was way down. Yeah. Of course, Los Angeles, the Z channel. That always sounded cool. The Z cool. channel. That's that always it. always sounded cool. <laughs> and the Los Angeles sports arena. That was it. Not the, not the forum. Okay. Um, so the garden had the MSG. I should point out, not Boston garden. They had their shows going on. The first show was back on in 73. It was televised, but here we are. We're in 77. And wouldn't you know it? The man who makes his debut at the January 77 show is the ring announcer is the Fink himself, Howard Finkel. I did not realize that he did his uh, uh, debut January 77. To me, I, I I felt like he'd been there all along, but that sounds right. Yeah. Uh, actually, I was just watching the Garden Show when I started my uh, 1987 project uh, in the WWF over on the Grenade Show, and the January Garden Show, they actually give Howard a plaque for 10 years with the company in 87, which I thought was cool. Yeah, I, I think it was cool that they honored him like that. I mean, Howard would sometimes be the uh, the the uh, brunt of practical jokes, yes. like at the Christmas parties and everything. Which I was like, okay, this guy's been with the company for twenty years. He's a loyal. Uh, he he's been loyal to the company. And this is how they treat him. I guess there's two sides to that coin. Here in '77, they actually expand their television as as far as the house shows go, though, as uh, they'll be making their debut on the Prism Network in Philadelphia with the Spectrum shows. Uh, that's going to start here in April of 77. So now we have the Garden and the Spectrum doing live shows. I mean, the world is changing thanks to cable TV. And I mean, I mean, wrestling is going to be changing dramatically due to cable TV. And, yeah, yeah, cable, you know, they needed that inventory. Um, I'm sure it was it was popular programming. I mean, I certainly would have watched it if I lived in New York or Philadelphia. So the structure of the house shows back then, mostly pre preliminary matches. Let's just say what they, a lot of the sm smaller towns and things of that nature had about six matches on a card. Some of the bigger shows had maybe eight matches on a card. If you were lucky at the MSG shows, you'd have something, something like that. But the structure of the house shows back then, lots of preliminary matches. You'd start off with the, with the, uh, Jose Gonzalez versus, you know, fill in the blank here. I'll let you run down a few of your, you know, but it, it built, it slowly built. Then the next match might be SD Jones. Or, or, you know, whomever, and it would just continue to build until you got your semi-main event and your main event. I mean, I, I liked, and it, it's what I grew up with. It's what I'm used to. If you went to a show, um, on, like TV was just this really good guy against this guy who stunk. Then you go to the house shows, and it's like, okay, the guy who never wins on TV versus the other guy who never wins on TV. Who's going to win this match? Yeah. I was always intrigued by that. You know, <laughs> give me Frank Rodriguez against Steve King. I just want to see who won. So I like yeah. that kind of stuff. <laughs> that would, that would uh, definitely be something like, ooh, where, where does this pecking order begin to end? Yes. That would be, that would, yeah. yeah, you're right, though. Yeah, I mean, you know, and you weren't, weren't going to get that on TV. Neither guy was a star. But, okay, you know, this is how the show starts. The, you're an opening match guy with an opening match talent. And a lot of people think that uh, the whole A and B show thing started with Vince. Well, we'll call, we'll call him Junior here, Vince McMahon Junior. A lot of people think that whole A, B, and then eventually C show too. Vince would do, but really, you would see it back here in the New York market. Back in the seventies, there were there was the A shows and the B shows, depending on the the week or the day or whatever. Yeah, on Saturdays they would typically run uh, two shows. Usually, it would be one major arena and then one smaller arena, but. I mean, I did notice that, you know, Boston, they would run Boston and then they would run another major arena on a Saturday night. And this is why, you know, they, they drew well, so I can't complain but um, or criticize too much. But, I mean, they would have some really thin shows at the Boston Garden. Like, you'd have that one main event and then it would be, like, all lower card guys. 
And I figure they just wanted to get as much as they could in it being a Saturday in the, in the big markets. Maybe even, even if they don't sell out, they'll, they'll do pr- well enough to where it was worthwhile uh, rather than throwing a show on a Wednesday or something. I don't know. I'm just exactly. I'm throwing things I mean, against the wall. I have no idea, but I just. It was, it was, I mean, Saturdays in the late 70s and early 80s for the WWF was a license to print money. I mean, some territories would be doing cartwheels. Oh, my God, we drew a $100,000 house. We've made it. WWF would draw $200,000 shows on one night. I mean, it, it's. You know, it's my home territory. I'm not, you know, putting it over because it's my hometown territory, but it was the territory where you made the most money. It's where everyone wanted to be. So we'll talk a little bit here about MSG and something that they would do back in this time period when Vince Sr. still worked with a lot of the other territories. He would bring in these guys for what I would call, I don't, don't know if they had another name for it back then, but showcase matches, essentially, they would bring guys in from other territories and they would showcase them here in the New York market. And I don't know, was there a reason to this? What Was it just for the publications, the magazines, to get it out there, to have the name out there, to say that they worked MSG? Was it Vince's way of kind of checking out the talent? This is guy, I, can I use this guy in six months or a year from now? I don't have an, an official explanation as to why it happened. My My guess is that, number one, the wrestler would be honored to wrestle at Madison Square Garden. It used to be that, you know, I wrestled Madison Square Garden was the equivalent of today, I wrestled on a WrestleMania. And and they would usually bring in guys who were either the promoter's sons, or in some cases, rumored <laughs> to be the promoter's son, or just someone who a promoter held in high regard. Right, and it starts off here in January, the first appearance, to my knowledge, of Pat Patterson showing up here in New York, uh, billed as the North American champion, much like Bobo Brazil's U.S. title. Pat Patterson scoring a win here in January over Baron Cicluna. Now, what Pat does different than a lot of these other guys as we go through this quick list here, Pat actually works a couple of house shows besides the Garden. He works Sunnyside Gardens as, as well as a show in Albany. Yeah, I'm not sure why that happened, um, but I do know that when Patterson was brought in in 1979, he was brought in with the understanding that, you know, Pat, Here's where you're going to retire. You're going to have a place in the office. Uh, you're going to help us book. So maybe that was just their way of getting to know Patterson a little bit better or That's, meeting him even. Right. Yeah. I mean, what a, what a booker, <laughs> you know, yeah. he did, that guy. Oh my God. Uh, that's definitely somebody to have on your, on your, uh, team for sure. Oh, absolutely. So, and supposedly Patterson was way better at, you know, telling guys how to parcel out a match than he was creating a program. Learn something new again. So Pat wasn't the only guy who uh, made his garden debut here, or at least uh, appearance here in January of 77. Uh, You talked about promoter's sons. Greg Gagne shows up here with a win over Johnny Rods. Yeah, Greg Gagne, not exactly a WWF type, but Vern Gagne was a big deal in the Northeast in the the 50s and 60s. -hmm. So based on that, bringing bringing in his son for a one and done makes a lot of sense. Uh, Mill Masker shows up with Mask here in February for a match, a win over uh, Doug Gilbert. He will return full time or at least semi full time here in the fall. So we'll touch a little later on Mill Masker's. But also uh, some other names coming in here. March, we see Don Kent. I'm sure Chief J. Strongbow had pulled some strings to bring him in. He's looking for another feud with Don Kent here this time. Yeah. <laughs> Don Kent comes in and does a draw on the undercard with Jose Gonzalez. Not really sure what that was about, but also a rumored to be promoter's son, as you talked about. Gino Hernandez shows up, and it's one and only WWF appearance, Gino getting a win over Johnny Rods. Actually, Gino worked a couple of TV tapings. I'm not sure what oh, happened. yes, you're right. It, it felt like, like they were going to bring him in, and then something went wrong. Uh, I, someone told me once that he just wasn't uh, exactly a hit in the dressing room. Um we Imagine talked, that. <laughs> yeah, really. I, not a 20-year-old Gino Hernandez. <laughs> but you know, we, we had mentioned that there, there's been a rumor out there that Paul Bosch is, in fact, Gino Hernandez's um, biological father. Right. It, it's a rumor. I, I don't believe it, even though there is a little bit of a, of a resemblance. Um, I just think that Paul Bosch saw something in Hernandez and pushed him. But I don't think I don't think it was uh, I don't think he was Bosch's kid. Yeah, and I've heard so many people profess that they know for a fact he is, and I've heard equal amount of people profess for the fact they know that he isn't. 
I guess we'll really never know. We just kind of got to pick and choose what we believe. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there, it's wrestling. There are always all kinds of rumors out there. And, and really with that rumor, it's kind of like flip a coin with me. If you're really hard selling me on that he's not on that day, I'm probably going along with you. And if you're really hard selling me that he is on that day, I'll probably go along with you as well. It's like, it's, really, I have no idea. It's, it's, it's hard to say. Yeah, so. no, my, my guess is that he isn't. And that the wrestlers who who wanted the push that Gino got in Houston was like, oh, it's it's this kid, no wonder. So, yeah, I can only imagine, like you said, like a 20-year-old Gino working MSG. He's already getting, he gets whatever he wants. He's he's already working Japan. He's he's doing everything, you know, down in Houston. He has to have no filter, you'd have to imagine, to a degree. He's already got everything to his head, and now he's working in New York City. I could see him coming into a TV taping after that. And uh, it, maybe not sitting well with some of the uh, old timers or the lo- long timers here in the in the, this territory. Yeah, I could certainly see a gorilla monsoon or a Chief J Strongbow being like, "Okay, why don't you just send this guy home?" <laughs> <laughs> so we fast forward another month into the garden. There's two shows at the beginning and the end of the month here in the month of March '77. And who appears on both of those shows? I think this is his debut here up in New York. The American Dream, baby, Death Rove coming in here. Dusty Rhodes, yeah, and I remember Dusty being on TV. It was like he didn't even have time to do like the regular tapings like everyone else. They would just like send up a tape from Florida. And yes, Dusty yes. Rhodes. Lots of Dusty Florida squash squashes air here through on TV throughout the uh, year of '77. Uh, it's just a good point that you made there. And uh, Dusty though gets wins here, back to back wins in March at the Garden over Pete Doherty and Tor Kamada. So Dusty comes in, and even though he's like a one-shot deal, we see guys getting wins over undercard. Johnny Rods, poor Johnny Rods, he was too talented for his own good, putting over a lot of these guys. Doherty makes sense in that spot as well, but Dusty over Tor Kamada, who was fairly you know decent you know uh, on the card. Obviously, he's like floundering around in that mid-card. I don't really know where to put him, but Dusty Road, you're coming in just working a show, and Dusty won't be back until the fall, and you're, you're scoring a pinfall win over Tor Kamada here. So obviously they had some plans for Dusty. They aired that match on television mm-hmm. a couple of times. Um, and again, you know, to me, it stands out like Dusty. They're building up Dusty Rhodes to come into Madison Square Garden. OK, and this guy can't find a, a Tuesday where he can just fly up to uh, Philadelphia <laughs> or Hamburg or wherever they were taping yeah. Allentown. And just put in that work. It's like, no, yeah, I was in Madison Square Garden. Here's the tape. Roll with that. Yeah, and that's basically what they did. They didn't really argue with it. I mean, that's just how big yeah. of a star Dusty was. It, it really. And, you know, we're getting ahead of ourselves. But, you know, when they had superstar Billy Graham versus Dusty Rhodes for the WWF championship, I mean, that was a dream match in 1977. So we roll on. Dusty's been in the company now. And then in May, what an odd name this one is. Uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this properly. A fellow by the name of Ron Mikulajczyk. I think I said that right. Uh, Ron Mikulajczyk. Lojczyk. Okay. Uh, he <laughs> I'm played... not saying it again. I'll let you. Now, he was, a, he was in the Giants, wasn't he? Yeah, he played for the Giants. And I think he played uh, in the World Football League for the Memphis team. So he was trying to get into wrestling. He did some spots in Memphis. It just it just didn't catch on with him. Frankly, I don't know what he was doing at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, that, that one really threw me off because I only knew him from the name from Memphis. I know he was kind of a buddy-buddy with Jerry Lawler, but he, he comes up here, and I guess it was just because he had come off of his run with the Giants. It's the only thing I can come up with, that he gets a garden match here, scores a win over Gas House Doug Gilbert. And it wasn't even like he was a big name with the New no, York Giants no, either. So right, I, yeah. I don't know. I, I can't explain that one. Yeah, that's that was an odd one. So it's heavy early on in, in January through May. We've got guys being showcased left and right. Then it starts to peter out here. Uh, we move on to August, August first garden, two garden shows in August. August first, it's Carlos Colon coming in, friend of Gorilla Monsoons. And then at the end of August, Vern Gagne, the father of Greg Gagne, comes in and Gagne demands uh, clearly demands to work a real talent here, uh, scoring a win. Over Nikolai Volkov. I don't give me Johnny Rods. I want I want somebody b- bigger than Johnny Rods. I want something with notoriety. Ganya scoring a win over Volkov, but Carlos Colon comes in too. And who does he beat? Johnny Rods. I mean, you know, to me, Nikolai Volkov was near the end of his run in 1977, so oh, yeah. it, it makes sense. Um, and yeah, but usually it was a Johnny Rods or a Frank Rodriguez. 
that got fed to the guys who were coming in to be showcased. So uh, as we move on, I should point out that the president was not always Jack Tunney, believe it or not, for people born uh, after 1980. Uh, back in the 70s, there was a fellow by the name of Willie Gilsenberg, who we kind of mentioned back in the uh, title stripping there, the tag title stripping. Uh, he'd been a former boxing promoter in his early days, became a wrestling event manager in the Newark area, uh, began working with Jack Pfeffer and Toots Month for the talent on those shows. And um, he caught onto the business and very business savvy. So naturally, enter Vince McMahon Jr. or Senior, sorry, who had recently secured a TV deal in the in the New York market with his father Jess McMahon, now deceased. He didn't really have him to, to lean on. So Vince needed allies in that New York market. You know, having been stationed in D.C. prior to that. For those who don't know, the WWF really got its start in Washington D.C. And uh, Vince Senior joins up with Tusmont. Johnny Doyle, Phil Zacco to create Capital Wrestling Corporation. And that was right around 57. So Gilsenberg slides in as a trusted confidant of one Vince McMahon and, and plays a mediator of sorts, issues between the owners as well as the wrestlers, other promoters. So Gilsenberg played a, an interesting part in the company. And he would join Capital Company and begin promoting shows mostly in New Jersey with the WWF talent. So he was a figurehead, but he also played a much larger part behind the scenes than like Jack Tunney did with the Canadian office. Yeah, I mean, I I'm not I don't know everything about Willie Gilsenberg, but what what I do know is that he was a good ally for Vince Senior. Like he could he knew people in the television industry, and he could he was very helpful to Vince Senior in that regard. And that's why uh, Vince Senior gave him that uh, you know figurehead role as the WWF president. You know, I mean, the guy was in the Madison Square Garden program every every month. All right. And uh, before we get to talking about some of the talent here, I wanted to talk to you about some of the referees, the other talent in the ring. And that could be a hard job in itself. Back then, we had Dusty Feldbomber, Dick Kroll, Dick Worley, Wee Willie Weber, Jack Lotz, John Stanley. Who were some of your favorites to watch back then? Or did you even pay attention to the referees? Because I always had a favorite at any given time. I I always liked Dick Kroll for whatever reason. I and I got to meet Dick Worley in the '80s, and I was just fascinated by that guy. He was something else. Dick Worley, another guy uh, who looked older than he actually was. You know, I was, when the first time I ever got to see Worley uh, from his '70s footage, I would uh, I would go, man, that guy looks you know 60. And I went and I Googled it years years ago, and I looked up how old he was, and I don't remember exactly how old he was, but he certainly looked a lot older than he actually was. He was in really good shape for a referee as well. He was. And um, he was my favorite from this time period, Dick Worley. And I'm not sure uh, if Gilberto Roman was doing anything at this point. I don't know. That guy's fascinating. How he had a job for as long as he did. And uh, Gorilla Monsoon always used to bury him on commentary like the most incompetent referee of all time. But I got to throw him in there. I'm not sure w when he came in to the company, but just another referee. But my favorite of the time, Dick Worley. And it's kind of funny. Your favorite was Dick Kroll. And I'll tell you what, you know, when you're a kid, you don't see things the way you do as you do when you're an adult. So there's probably guys you appreciate more now than you did then and vice versa. There's probably guys you love then. And you go, man, what was I thinking? But Dick Kroll was one of those referees for me as a kid. I just thought he looked kind of clunky, kind of dorky. I didn't really like, it. I was like, it's, th it's this referee. But as I got older and I saw all the matches that he, you know, he was, he was headline referee and MSG many a time. And I go, you know what? This guy really knew what he was doing in there. So I have a, an adult appreciation for Dick Kroll, where as much as a kid, we, used to laugh and, and <laughs> kind of make fun of him. Look at that bald referee, you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, the referees, they were like they were like school teachers. Like Dick Kroll was like kind of the laid back school teacher. And Dick Worley was the school teacher who was always yelling at everybody. <laughs> I just I love to meet Dick Worley. Uh, it's unfortunate, you know, that he aged out by the time everything changed over. But I mean, he was stationed in that area. I don't see him going national. No, it could have been, I, could have I been wrong, him. but. I saw him uh, refereeing a couple of shows in New Jersey, a couple of indie shows back in the uh, mid late eighties. And, you know, he was just a, a commission referee. All right. So now we begin the talk of some of the talent here. And uh, we're, we're really having a great conversation here, John, we're running a lot longer than I expected through the, the early part of the notes. So I don't know if it's okay with you and, and it's up to you. I'd love to have you back. Whatever we don't finish here today. I'd love to have you back for another episode. I'd love to do another episode. I, I would love to do part two of this. Oh, excellent. Because that's it's probably going to take two parts. And so I think a really good closing point here, because we've got a lot to cover on him, 
really good closing point here for this very first episode of the Regional Wrestling Podcast, John. I want to talk about Bruno Sammartino and his uh, last bit of a run here as the WWF champion going into 80, uh, excuse me, 77. Bruno, the champion, at least for the first four months of the year. Yeah, and it was, you know, it was business as usual. You would have Bruno, you know, he defended against Stasiak in Madison Square Garden. Now it's time for him to defend uh, against Stasiak in Boston. Uh, we still had Ken Patera matches going on. Let me see. In, in New York, he had Patera in January, February, I want to say. And, and then March. His final. What's that? And March, three months. And, oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. And then his final a successful title defense in New York was against Baron Von Raschke in April. And like I said, it was, you know, superstar Billy Graham came back. And I, at the time I was like, wow, it feels like he just left. And, and uh, George Steele came back right around the same time. Professor Toru Tanaka came back as a single. So I'm thinking, okay, we're going to be seeing San Martino Tanaka down the road. And that's right. not exactly how it worked out. No. And we'll look at, you know, we'll, we'll break down some of the bigger cities here and just look what Bruno did city to city, because it, it wasn't like, you know, the eighties where Hogan had a, a storyline. And so he was working that guy everywhere. They went well, mostly everywhere. Let's say Hogan feuding with Paul Orndorff, most of 86 and 87, 99% of the time you were getting Hogan and Orndorff in some way, shape or form in every market. If, if, if it was the Hogan market, I mean, and here, not so much. Bruno had his different matches with different people in every city so for instance let's look at boston uh january bruno comes in gets a win over nikolai one off again february and march bruno san martino has the return matches with stan stasiak i call them return matches from 73 so these are the matches we saw at the end of 76 in msg now we're seeing him in boston bruno over nikolai then he does double two matches here with stasiak february stasiak gets the win by disqualification they come back in march this time, Bruno going over Stasiak. And then in April, they, we see one one matchup, Bruno and Patera leading Patera. I think Patera does the job on a DQ there. Well, the, the, what they usually did was, I mean, I can, I'm not I'm really an expert on Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Baltimore. Mm -hmm. But in New York, they would have Bruno against like Ken Patera. And then they'd have that series. And as that series was ending, like three months from the time it started, it would start in Boston. Like um, Ken Patera would make his WWF debut in Madison Square Garden, getting a title match. Whereas we'd see Patera on TV for two or three months before he got a, a title match in Boston. And usually he would have a match against a, a guy lower on the card, like uh, Victor Rivera, a, you know, a Tony Gurria, that type of, of competitor. You know, you, you, he wouldn't debut against the champion. So we look at spe the spectrum here. So we, like you were just talking about, we get these matches like this. Bruno again over Volkov, uh, over Bruiser Brody here in Philly, and Stasiak in January, February, and April. Nassau, for instance, in January, and I, and I put this down just because of the match that it was. Bruno wrestles Bruiser Brody inside a steel cage here. That would be a hell of a match. It would be, and you know, Nassau is a really interesting city, especially in 1977, because the guys who did not get to wrestle superstar Billy Graham at Madison Square Garden got their matches at, in Long Island. They, you know, they would have superstar Billy Graham against Chief J. Strombo, against Billy White Wolf, uh, against Haystack Calhoun, against uh, I, yeah. I think Gorilla Monsoon. No, that was New York, but again, I know against Haystack Calhoun. Like that next level down where you're not Bruno, you're not Putski, but you know that's where the guys would get their title matches against Graham. Yeah, it was essentially like the B arena in the New York City area. Exactly. So we get Bruno over Brody in a steel cage in January. Bruno comes back in February, March, and does two matches with Stasiak. So Stasiak's really still getting pushed here like he was when he first came back working those garden shows, the MSG shows in November, December of 76. Clearly, in the early part of 77, Stasiak still being pushed pretty hard because he's working Bruno in Boston, in Philly, at the Nassau Coliseum, or in, in Nassau. So, Bruiser Brody, Stasiak for a couple of matches, and then in April, much like in Boston, it's Bruno and Patera in a non-finish again. So, they're starting to feed Patera into the championship caliber level, even though we're really not going to see any more return matches because Patera's title matches are coming in April and we know what's coming in April. 
Yeah, and it, it was a little bit weird when the guy had a the, you know another match in in uh, Nassau in Long Island after he had already lost to Bruno in Madison Square Garden. You know, if you're in Long Island, I mean, you're getting Channel Nine on TV, so you right. know. Stays, you're like, hey, Stan Stasiak already had his matches against Bruno and, yeah. and didn't get it done. Other odd odd cities I was looking at, I thought this was interesting, up in Landover, and obviously I'm covering Landover for a reason here as we begin 77. In January, it's Bruno again over Brody, this time in a Lumberjack match. So Bruno was doing these matches with, with Bruiser Brody, but I noticed in some instances, even though these are gimmick matches, there weren't really first matches like to set up these return, which what should be return matches. And I'm not saying that's the case in every instance, but there are some gimmick matches here between Brody and Bruno that just don't make any sense why they're happening. I'm not, I'm not arguing them. If I'm watching them, I'm excited for them. But uh, at the same time, just like, wow, they just went straight to this. Yeah, that, that makes very little sense. They did that once in Boston in 82 when they had, you know, first match Bob Backlund against superstar Billy Graham is a Texas death match, but at least you could say, okay, well, they had the angle coming off TV to do that. Right. Whereas, you know, Brody, you know, never did a, a television angle with Bruno. So you're right. That makes no sense. Yeah. And that's a missed opportunity. They could have done something with Brody and Bruno on TV. That would have been fabulous. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And again, I thought, you know, even as a kid, I'm like, okay, you got this bruiser Brody, Brody guy who's like six, seven, or is, at least is being billed as such, you know, why not have a battle of the giants with Andre? Yeah, absolutely. So we get Bruno over Brody here in a Lumberjack match. Then they come back in February. Bruno over Torquemada, who wasn't really getting title shots on the big markets either. I oh, mean, sorry. I, where was this? This was in Landover in February. Bruno okay. over well, Torquemada. I, I, that's a match I did not know about. So uh, those were some of the other markets. But then we look at Madison Square Garden. Three matches coming into the year immediately. January, February, and the first Garden show in March, early March. I think it was March 7th. It was Bruno San Martino working a brand new talent, a brand new top heel by the name of Ken Patera, who makes his MSG debut at this January show. And that was commonplace. A lot of people might say, wow, he came right in and got a title shot against Bruno. They did that with a lot of their top heels. Instead of working your way up in New York, a lot of times you worked your way down the card. That's exactly what happened in New York. Typically, uh, a, a heel would show up. He'd do two sets of TV tapings. And his first night on the road in the territory was to wrestle the champion in New York City. I mean, and you're right. I mean, you, you know, talk about starting out at the top. So Patera makes his MSG debut, working the, the WWF champion, Bruno San Martino, and defeats Bruno on a count out here after hitting Bruno with a chair as Bruno's trying to get back in the ring. Bruno eats the count out, so Patera gets the first big win here, which makes him a viable contender for a rematch. So we fast forward a month to February in the Garden. Bruno again with Patera. This time they battle to a double disqualification in a Texas death match. I'm not sure how you do that, but the referee goes down and the match ruled a, a no contest of sorts. Yeah, they, I mean, the WWF, well, let's be honest, they <laughs> really, <laughs> I mean, it was a place where you had all kinds of crazy uh, finishes, you know, like, for example, the cage match is the first man who walks out of the cage or climbs over the cage. Right. Uh, you had disqualifications in Texas death matches. Uh, a lot of it just made no sense. Yeah, I don't know that the WWF ever had one legit Texas death match. <laughs> We've talked about this before. I mean, a Texas death match, it's self-defining. I mean, in, in New York, it was just a match <laughs> with theoretically no rules, even though right. the referee was constantly involved in the Texas death right. match. And the guys weren't fighting to the death. And, you know, obviously you have the Amarillo style Texas death match, which, you know, the WWF just wasn't wasn't having any part of. And so this is what I found interesting, because we know Bruno's getting ready to drop the belt anyway. And usually every challenger got their th if they were a viable contender, they got their three matches with the champion. And so we move ahead to March and the third match. This is where the champion usually beats the challenger. But it doesn't happen that way. Bruno does beat Patera. But it's, when, it's only when uh, guest referee Gorilla Monsoon stops the match due to the blood loss. So we're seeing that again here. So Bruno never definitively beats Patera in this three-match series. One thing the WWF always did, the heel was almost never beaten conclusively. Uh, I mean, the whole time that Bob Backlund had the title, you know, it was always like the, the heel had his foot on the ropes or there was a special referee who who wasn't exactly biased or there was a blood stop or something. 
the heel always had an out, and I'm not exactly sure why they did that, but throughout the Bruno and Backlund uh, eras, you know, there was always a story behind, you know, why the heel lost, you know, and, you know, the I mean, whatever it was, usually it was the foot on the ropes, and, and the heel always had an excuse. Yeah, I believe, I think, wasn't, uh, when Bob beat Graham, wasn't Graham's foot under the ropes or on the ropes or something like that? So even when Bob won the belt, wasn't, am I, am I remembering that correctly? You are remembering it correctly. Superstar Billy Graham had his foot uh, on the bottom rope, and that's kind of what they based the rematch upon, that Graham said, you know, hey, he never beat me. Uh, my, my foot was on the ropes. And there was a little bit of a, I don't know, an irony because Superstar Billy Graham beat Bruno using the, the his feet, feet on the, on the ropes, ropes for right. leverage. Yeah. And then a year later, he's, you know, he, he once again, he has his foot on the ropes, but it just doesn't matter. So we get the three match series though with Kim Patera and we're coming to an end. We're coming close to an end here, but before Bruno finishes up as champion, he has two matches with Baron Von Raschke, a buddy of his, I believe uh, once late in March, March 28th at the garden. And then again, April 25th. So the first time Bruno beats Von Raschke by disqualification after uh, Von Raschke, Bruno winds up getting his leg tied up in the rope and Von Raschke goes outside and grabs himself a steel chair and commits to beating down on San Martino, obviously you got to have your rematch then. Even though Bruno got the win, he wants that revenge, and that's what we get here in April. And that's Bruno this time defeating Von Raschke, which sadly would become Bruno's final ever title defense in the Garden. And that was something I, I can tell you right now I did not see coming. I mean, superstar Billy Graham, I know in real life that was it was far from out of the blue it had been planned for quite some time mm -hmm. but for me i mean it was like well when they announced on tv that superstar billy graham had defeated uh bruno san martino for the championship i mean it was like lightning struck me man it was it was literally i don't want to say all i could think about all day but i was thinking about it all day so bruno is the world beater he's mosing along beating stan hansen bruiser brody stan stasiak a former champion Ken Patera, you know, uh, Bruno essentially uh, wins that battle. Baron von Raschke, we're in the middle of all of this, and then out of nowhere, it happens. You know what that it is, John? Uh, I do believe I, I know what that is. April 30th, 1977 in Baltimore, Maryland, of all places. The guy knows his dates. Just five days after that guard match with the Baron, out of nowhere in Baltimore, of all places, we have a new WWWF, see, I did it for that, heavyweight champion in the superstar Billy Graham. And I think that's a great place to wrap up and, and package this episode, John, because everything moving forward, the world changes here in the WWF because we have a, not only a heel champion, but a heel champion that's going to hold the belt for more than a week or two. It was the only time that happened until the added uh, between from the time the WWF became a thing until the attitude era. Superstar Billy Graham was the only champion to hold the, the he was the only heel to hold the championship for a significant amount of time. And, you know, yeah, I'm, a, I'm aware of Randy Savage. I mean, he was a heel for about two months before he lost the title back to Hogan. So it was it was definitely a unique time. And my understanding is that, you know, I, I, I've never seen the television, but my understanding is they had a show scheduled for uh, the Baltimore Arena. They were going to have a battle royal where the winner gets to take on Bruno San Martino, and Graham just comes to the ring and says, you know, no, I don't want to be in the battle royal. I just want a title match. And everyone just kind of said, okay, which makes no sense, but <laughs> that's my understanding of what they did. Well, Graham was smart. You know, those those battle royals can be dangerous in in real yeah. life. You can you can break an ankle there pretty easily with the wrong guy landed on you. So he was like, I, I'm not chancing this for anything, guys. Maybe he really in real life. Maybe he walked back there and scrapped that battle royal <laughs> <laughs> uh, behind the scenes. Like, I, I'm not taking any chances. I want that title because, you know, and I, the only thing I can think of as far as a heel title run beyond this. You're right. I, I don't think until Yokozuna. Uh, when he beats Hogan back for the belt in June of 93, he holds the belt till WrestleMania the next year. Yokozuna oh, had like a right. nine, nine month run, which is still longer than, you know, whatever. But I, I mean, yeah, up until the nineties, you're talking a long, long time down the road <laughs> between yeah, Graham and, and, and Yoko. So it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I can't wait to talk about superstar Graham and, and his run as champion here in the WWF here in the next episode. I th I think we we broke this down pretty well. We we talked about 
pre Graham being champion, we're wrapping up with that. And when we start again, we'll we'll start with superstar Billy Graham being the World Wrestling Federation champion. Yeah, we're going to talk about the title change. We're going to talk about all of his defenses throughout the year. Lots of names to look at. So many guys coming into the territory. Haichi, Peter Maivia, Fuji and Tanaka will be back as tag team champions eventually down the line here. Dusty Rhodes will be back on TV feuding with Superstar Graham. Some good matches there in the garden. Bob Backlund, he's going to be here all year, at least on our TV screen. Chief J Strongbow going to have to go into singles. We're going to talk about that injury to Billy White Wolf at the hands of Kim Batera. So much to cover next time. I am looking forward to it. You know, I, like I said, I, I it was my first full year as a fan, and I, I loved it. And I'm looking forward to, to talking about superstar Billy Graham as WWF champion uh, in 1977. As am I, and I just absolutely love your vivid memory. Uh, you know, you remember things. You remember the matches, the guys that were in the ring, the reason why this match happened. Maybe it's lost in time. Otherwise, I, you know, there's no mention of it online. You can't find why this match happened, but you know there had to be something. And usually you can find that kind of information, but every once in a while you can't. I feel like you've done that here a couple times. i got to go back and figure out when they were again, but you've done <laughs> that to, for me here a couple times on this show. Why? Oh, now that makes sense. Like Kevin Sullivan being written out. I didn't know that was at the hands of Kim Patera, so I learned something new, and I am glad that I had John here as a guest. Well, Ken Patera was running wild, ending careers with his swinging neck breaker, and that's what kept things... Uh, interesting for him because obviously, you know, one thing about the WWF, they had one champion at this point, you know, once Bobo Brazil and that Air Castle United States champion disappeared, you know, there was only one singles title. And, you know, if the baby face was a champion, the, the other baby faces were effectively eliminated from contention. And when superstar Billy Graham was the champion, guys like Ken Patera and Spiros Arion were effectively eliminated as challengers. But we'll get more into that next time, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, as am I, guys. I appreciate everybody. A brand new show, the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, and that's what we did today. We'll be back with the other half of this 1977 project. It's been a hell of a lot of fun with you, John, and I look forward to talking to you again. I, I am grateful that you had me on. Thank you, Ray. Absolutely. For those listening on the Wrestling Memory Grenade, we will be back next week. We'll resume the 1987 project in the WWF. And anybody looking for this show here, the Regional Wrestling Podcast, talking with John McAdam about 1977 and so forth as I go on with the newest addition to the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. You guys can continue to listen to this show on WrestleCopia.com or all of your favorite podcast streaming apps. Thanks again, John. This has been Regional Wrestling, where we talk the territories. We'll be right back. 